Honorable members, the prayer. Lord, the God of righteousness and truth, grant to our queen, to her government, to members of the Legislative Assembly and to all in positions of responsibility, the guidance of your spirit. May they never lead the province wrongly through love of power, desire to please, or unworthy ideas, but laying aside all private interest and prejudice, keep in mind their responsibility to seek to improve the condition of all. Honorable members, please remain standing as we pay tribute to a former member of this assembly who passed away recently. Mrs. Jordan, Mrs. Judy Gordon was elected as a progressive conservative member for Lacombe Stetler on June 15, 1993 and was re-elected in 1997 and 2001 general elections. She served three terms for that constituency until 2004. In addition to serving on numerous committees and task force, Ms. Gordon was the deputy chair of committees from 1997 to 2001. On April 23, 1997, she and two other women, including our current clerk, made Alberta legislative history when for the first time, the presiding officer and table officers were all women. Ms. Gordon's career began in 1977 as an accountant, then moved into politics in 1986 when she served an elected councillor for the city of Lacombe. In 1989, Ms. Gordon was elected mayor of Lacombe, a position she held until 1993, and again from 2004 to 2010. After her tenure in the Legislative Assembly of Alberta, Ms. Gordon was dedicated to her community, serving tirelessly as a strong voice for her constituents. Judy Gordon passed away last week at the age of 72. In a moment of silent prayer, I ask that each of you remember Mrs. Gordon as you may have known her. Rest eternal, grant unto her, O Lord, and let light perpetual shine upon her. Please be seated. Introduction of visitors, introduction of guests, ministerial statements. Member statements. The Honourable Member for Calgary, McCall. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This Premier has failed Albertans at, as, at every step of this pandemic. He blamed my constituents and the entirety of Northeast Calgary for spreading the COVID-19 virus. He defended his anti-science, anti-mask MLAs who spread dangerous misinformation claiming that wearing masks spread COVID, that children washing their hands was unacceptable, and that the worst of COVID was behind us. He also refused the chief medical officer's advice on a number of important matters related to this pandemic. When the Minister of Transportation friend organized the first anti-mask rally, the Premier refused to condemn it. It's the same organizer who accused member of Calgary police of being Nazis and claimed that the Premier had given him permission to violate public health order. The Premier didn't feel the need to refute this. Throughout this pandemic, while our public health officials have been working day and night to save lives, this Premier and this Health Minister actively undermined them. By doing this, they encouraged their far-right friends to take actions against our public health officials and measures. And now we see that John Carpe, who this Premier once shockingly compared to Rosa Parks, is suing our Chief Medical Officer of Health for trying to protect lives, Mr. Speaker. The Premier hasn't denounced this lawsuit. He hasn't condemned those filing it. He hasn't even defended our Chief Medical Officer from the hateful actions of his friends. The Premier is not a leader. He's a failure, and Albertan deserves so much better. for Calgary Glenmore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This Thursday, December 10th, or the 25th of Kislev, marks the beginning of Hanukkah, the Festival of Lights. 
In the Hebrew language, the meaning of Hanukkah is to dedicate. Hanukkah is an eight-day Jewish celebration that serves to commemorate the rededication of the Second Temple in Jerusalem during the period around 160 BCE. There is, in fact, much history to reflect on when considering the historical origins of Hanukkah as a series of turbulent historical events that inspired this most important Jewish celebration. After banning Judaism and its practices, then King Antioch, Antiochus IV Epiphanes and his armies defiled the Second Temple, erected an altar to Zeus, and decreed an end to many Jewish faith practices. The Jewish community revolted, culminating in the reclamation of the temple and the rebuilding of the altar. The altar was rebuilt by Maccabee and the sacred lamp had to be relit, but there was only enough sanctified oil remaining in the temple to keep the lamp burning for one day. It would take eight days to produce more sanctified oil. And then the miracle occurred. The lamp stayed lit for the whole eight days. The miracle of light. As Hanukkah is celebrated this year, we are inspired by that miracle. This has been a difficult year, and we've been inspired by the Jewish community's capacity to worship and celebrate safely. I was reminded of this as I spoke to Mrs. S. a few days ago, who pointed out how so many families celebrated the high holidays in September in a safe way. I want to um, wish everybody in the Jewish community a safe and happy Hanukkah. It will be different this year, but I know that we will all find a way to celebrate safely. So to all, a very happy Hanukkah. The Honourable Member for Central Peace. It was the night before Christmas when all through the land COVID was stirring, it was getting out of hand. The children were in school with hand sanitizer, with teachers so diligent they made them the wiser. The doctors were wrestling with pandemic effects, working into the night so their plans had no wrecks. Nurses also had their essential work to do, they masked, they shielded and sanitized too. The truckers who delivered the product we need delivered on time with deadlines to heed. They drove day and night crossing borders with ease, only to be stopped if they happened to sneeze. I have to admit the ones I most think of are the grocery store clerks as precious as dove. When over toilet paper people did battle, the clerks sorted them out just like cattle. Now some of the most hardest hit souls were the people employed in tourism roles. Whether store clerks or guides or hotel staff, they had no clients, not even the riffraff. Now Winnick, now Shandro, now Hinshaw and Kenny on cabinet on legislatures on AHS and health ministry. They had so many tough decisions to make regarding a virus no one knew how to take. In the beginning, it was all about flattening the curve, not to overburden the health system, it was to serve. No decisions were made without great angst. It was easy to see there weren't many thanks. There is no doubt there were mistakes made that became apparent as time was to fade. As spring turned into summer, the numbers did drop, leaving people to believe the plan was a flop. But summer turned to fall, and to winter we went. The numbers rose, and Dr. Hinshaw did present. Other options for bringing the numbers down low in hopes that rising hospitalizations would slow. The decisions made were easy to criticize. Even this author took time to surmise. Decisions are made with the best intent, so Albertans not to hospitals be sent. The most vulnerable to COVID we found in the end were seniors in health compromise with nothing to fend. Our sorrow goes out to those that were lost. Their families and friends sure felt a great cost. Now on the horizon, we have a vaccine. Our Alberta group will be delivering routines. So now as we look forward to 2021, the economy will return and along with it fun. We know Albertans in the end will persevere and we'll look forward to the future with plenty of cheer. So as we go into this Christmas season, never forget the celebration's reason to remember a child born in a stable at night. So Merry Christmas to all and to all a good night. I uh, reminded the member last week that perhaps the use of a prop, no matter how noble it is, uh, was still unacceptable and the same would go today with the use of names in a member statement. I know that the Honourable Member can do better, and I'm sure that he will. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Meadows. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Farmers are protesting the Indian government's agriculture bells, calling out the bells attack on the agriculture produce market and the minimum support price, and viewing these bells as a death warrant for them. After months-long demonstration and no government attention to help, the massive protest broke where the farmers called to let's move to Delhi, the capital of India. The union governments of BJP and the Haryana government led by BJP failed in their attempts to suppress the protesters by barricading them and using water cannons. 
The protesters' peaceful agitation continues and hundreds of thousands are staging at the dharna at Delhi borders as we speak. Three general strikes, a complete shutdown of India were called and hundreds of millions of Indians have participated in these strikes and protest in solidarity, solidarity with the farmers. The farmers' support has grown worldwide and the people have been protesting and politicians are speaking in support of the farmers. The protests are also, the pro <clears throat> also being organized in Calgary and in Minton. Many events supporting the farmers were organized over the past weekend in my riding in Edmonton Meadows. But Indian BJP government is still committed to implementing its plan to increase big corporate profits over agriculture. Mr. Speaker, we know prioritizing corporations over people does not work. Here in Alberta, the UCP government has handed out $4.7 billion to big profitable corporations and hasn't created a single job, nor yielded any benefits to Albertans. Mr. Speaker, along with my NDP caucus colleagues, I support the farmers' right to peaceful protests and ask the BGP government of India to stop using the system to barricade the protests and come to a meaningful resolution to the farmers' concerns. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Spruce Grove, Stony Plain. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It was a session before Christmas and all through the ledge, while the MLAs were shouting and clearly, and clearly on edge, for the NDP were fighting for red tape far and near and have been using their tools of fear and smear. They were getting mad at the sewer rats around for exiling the opposition in the last electoral round. But with anger and Twitter and a whole lot of growling, they still use their affiliate and friend Gil McGowan. But Albertans <laughs> need not be worried and feel quite at ease, for they know that Team Orange is always displeased. For in 2020 came an unexpected guest named COVID-19, and due to him, we've had no rest. But with the calm guidance of Dr. Hinshaw and her wonderful chemistry coat, we will all get through this, but it's too soon to gloat, for Albertans are looking for our government with hope that we can build our society that is resilient in scope. To create jobs in our province with a pipeline or three, and look for value-add industries and high-tech and trees, to help lead the charge without calling them out, for the speaker will call it unparliamentary and shout. But from Acadia and Grand Prairie to simply name a few, Albertans can rest assured that the people in charge know what to do. And at the helm of the government, from Lougheed as his writing, is a leader that Albertans can trust with no semblance of backsliding. So with plans for hydrogen and trying to help businesses out, we will not care how much the NDP shout, because they had four years to show us with policies that were tired. And when Albertans had their chance to the NDP, they said, you're fired. So to finish my poem to Albertans far and near, from La Crete to Fort Mac and even Red Deer, we're working as hard as we can, beyond doubt there cannot be, to ensure that our children's future is strong and Alberta remains free. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Millwoods. Mr. Speaker, many times I've heard this Premier speak about not wanting to infringe on the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Bill 47, however, removes many rights from Alberta workers, and when it comes to those rights, we haven't heard a peep. Bill 47 will remove rights from the working Albertans that keep our provincial economy going, and this government is now rushing to do so during the biggest health crisis our province has ever faced. This bill attacks workers' right to know about hazards in their workplace. This bill attacks workers' right to participate in the decision-making for their own safe work environment. This bill attacks workers' right to refuse unsafe work. This bill attacks workers, full stop. Albertans have the right to know when their government is debating these sorts of important changes. But this government brought forward Bill 47 during a pandemic with minimal consultation, while Alberta families are naturally focused on their own lives and livelihoods. Rushing through these massive labour reforms with minimal debate is morally wrong and an affront to our province's democratic traditions. Bill 47 is stripping away presumptive coverage for PTSD trauma while our doctors, nurses and medical staff are dealing with daily COVID-19 horrors in their workplace. Think about that. As we speak, some of Alberta's healthcare heroes are currently suffering mental health injuries on the job. We are in here with this UCP government rushing to take away PTSD coverage for the brave Albertans who may need it very soon. It's beyond shameful, and this government and this Premier have lost their moral compass. The actions of this government are repugnant, and Albertans know it. 
This bill attacks the rights and the safety of every single person that has kept us healthy and safe during the pandemic, and it attacks the rights and safety of every single person who will help us build our province back up. The very people this government swore they're looking after. This is not leadership. The UCP does not have the best interests of Albertans in mind. Mr. Speaker, as we approach holiday season, it's important for Albertans of all faiths to prepare for unusual COVID-driven celebratory observance. At this time of year, families and friends are typically planning gatherings and celebrations. However, this year, we're in a heated battle with a global pandemic. Current restrictions limit gatherings and visits, but let's be grateful that Albertans are still busy planning a distance festive season, connecting in unique and creative ways with plans for virtual gatherings and never again taking hugs, embraces and shared cheer for granted. Sadly, it's our province's most respected and valued citizens that will undoubtedly feel most isolated during these increasingly challenging times. It has become painfully clear that seniors are most vulnerable when it comes to isolation, enduring health and mental health risks of COVID-19. Therefore, the priority for Albertans must be on protecting themselves, being responsible to others with particular diligence if your life includes interaction with vulnerable family, friends or others in the community. I urge all Albertans to consider not only our treasured seniors, but those that care for each of each and every day for those uh, concerned. A family member living with you, an isolated senior living on their own, or to those caring for residents in various public, private and non-profit residential settings, you all deserve our heartfelt thanks. Luckily for us, we live in an age where we can reach out to loved ones and colleagues with a few simple clicks, something all Albertans, even the technologically challenged, should take advantage of over the coming weeks. Whether it's a phone call, video call, or even a video message, 10 minutes or an hour, any time you reach out will change someone's day for the better, letting them know that you care and that they are not alone. To all members of this assembly, our incredible dedicated staff, and to all Albertans across this province, stay healthy, be responsible, and take care of yourself and others as we face this challenge together as proud, strong, free, responsible, and compassionate Albertans. And happy holidays to all, thoughts and prayers to all. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cardston Siksika has a statement to make. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm very pleased to hear the news that Alberta's agriculture is leading Alberta's economic recovery. Strong numbers throughout the year show that the hard work of farmers and ranchers is paying off. After a record year, agriculture exports have surged by 30%, resulting in nearly $190 million in new exports. Farmers and ranchers work tirelessly every day to provide us with the food that we need and has proven very successful this year. Agriculture is very important to my constituency and I'm happy to say that they are part of this economic recovery. Agriculture is the foundation of our province and was a major contributor to how this province was founded. During the late 1800s, settlers found abundant grasses and a climate moderate by, uh, moderated by Chinook winds in the winter, which was assumed would make year-round grazing possible. When the Government of Canada adopted, or rather developed, the Canadian Pacific Railway in southern Alberta in 1883, it brought a wave of immigration uh, that would peak just before World War II, World War, the First World War. Many of these immigrants to Alberta were settlers from Europe, but also others from eastern provinces and the United States, uh, in which many of them were granted homesteads. Homesteads were granted land in which they were primarily relied on wheat as their main crop. As the province grew and developed over the years, so did our agriculture industry. Today, we can see our agriculture industry spread throughout the province, either by producers of crops or livestock. I'm proud that my constituency of Cardston Siksik is involved in such a great and historic part of this province. Alberta's agriculture is strong, stronger now more than ever and has been a leader in our economic recovery. I would like to thank all the farmers who worked tirelessly throughout the year, even in the pandemic, to drive economic innovation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Here, here. Honourable members, the time is 1.50 and that makes it oral question period. And the leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition has the call. 20,000 active cases. Mr. Speaker, that is a line no one thought we would cross last month, but here we are. The Premier's half measures are not working. Yesterday, Dr. Hinshaw was asked directly what needed to happen, and she said, quote, the current measures we have in place are not likely to be sufficient to bring down our numbers. If the goal is to bring down our numbers, we will need additional measures to do that. So to the Premier, is his goal to bring the numbers down? And if so, why hasn't he taken action yet to do that? The Honourable Government House Leader. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Premier has taken action all along the way, doing our best as a government to be able to balance lives and livelihoods, Mr. Speaker. There's been restrictions that have been made at different intervals over the last several weeks. And the Premier and the Health Minister will have a press conference later this afternoon to talk about the next steps for our province. Again, Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue not to uh, let the NDP continue to play politics with people's lives. Instead, we're going to focus as a government on getting Alberta through this, Mr. Speaker, focusing on protecting lives and livelihoods. Leader of the Opposition. Well, Mr. Speaker, instead of decisive action, Albertans watched their Premier spend all of November rejecting public health advice, delivering lectures about comorbidities, blaming ethnic communities, failing to support small and medium-sized businesses, catering to anti-maskers, jeopardizing health care resources, hiding information, and then hiding himself from the public. As of today, we've lost more than 600 Albertans, and there are 600 more in hospital. Yeah. Premier, why did you waste all of November, and why are you still wasting time now? The Mr. Speaker, only the NDP would think that the unprecedented steps that this government had to take in November, Mr. Speaker, are nothing, Mr. Speaker. They had significant impacts on the people of Alberta. Uh, but, Mr. Speaker, there are actions that had to be taken to be able to stop uh, COVID-19 from proceeding at the rapid rate that is through our population. Again, the, Mr. Speaker, the Premier and the Health Minister will have more steps that they will announce later this afternoon, Mr. Speaker. But unlike the NDP, we're not going to play politics with people that are dying, Mr. Speaker. Shame on them, Mr. Speaker. Instead, we're going to focus on lives and livelihoods, Mr. Speaker, standing with Albertans and getting them through it, and the NDP should stop their fear monger. The Leader of the Opposition. Well, your focus on livelihood has lost lives. The Premier claimed that his failure to protect public health was about saving the economy, but it was really just about giving himself an excuse to ignore businesses in need. Listen, we know some form of lockdown is inevitable, and businesses will suffer even more. So, we've heard from businesses that your programs have not been enough to keep them afloat. In advance of further restrictions, will you commit today to at least provide $25,000 to support each business that is struggling through this pandemic? The Honourable Minister of Finance, President of the Treasury Board. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, here, here's the truth. Uh, this government rose very quickly uh, after we faced the pandemic and announced a series of initiatives that provided relief to small businesses. And small businesses have been challenged. Mr. Speaker, we announced and rolled out the Workers' Compensation Board premium abatement, which provides uh, premium coverage uh, for half of the year for small and medium-sized businesses. Mr. Speaker, we, uh, we deferred corporate income taxes. Mr. Speaker, we've rolled out with the business relaunch grant. We've added to it, and the Minister of Jobs and the Economy and Innovation will be making more announcements this afternoon. The Honourable, the Leader, the Official Opposition. Well, I certainly hope he takes our advice. Now, today we learned that the Canadian forces are prepared to deploy troops in Alberta to deal with the crisis created by COVID-19 and this government's failure to act. According to CBC, they are anticipating demand by calling in hundreds of reservists. They're being trained now on how to wear PPE, how to look after seniors in long-term care, and they're being trained on how to comfort Albertans who are dying from COVID-19. Premier, our health care system is overwhelmed because of your bad decisions. Now we're asking for field hospitals and calling in the military. How could you possibly let it come to this? The Honourable the Government Health Leader. Mr. Speaker, the answer is that is not true, Mr. Speaker. The Alberta government has not called uh, for the military to be in Alberta, Mr. Speaker. We are continuing uh, to move forward as a province, Mr. Speaker, to again help protect Albertans as well as protect their livelihoods, Mr. Speaker. The Premier and the Health Minister have more announcements tomorrow, but the NDP continuing to make things up inside the House, Mr. Speaker, is not helpful, Mr. Speaker. That's just fear-mongering and it's very, very disappointing behaviour from the Leader of the Official Opposition. The Leader of the Opposition. right. I misspoke. They didn't call in the military. What actually happens is that they're entirely out of the loop. The health minister's office told CBC they didn't even know the forces were planning a deployment. Mr. Speaker, based on that statement, it appears the Canadian military is actually planning around this government's incompetence. That is next level incompetence. Yeah. Can that premier explain how in heaven's name he doesn't know the military is planning to deploy hundreds of soldiers into Alberta's long-term care as early as this weekend? What is going going on over there? The Honourable Government Health Leader. Mr. Speaker, that is not true, Mr. Speaker. It's disappointing to see uh, the leader of the official opposition stating things, Mr. Speaker, that are very clearly not factual inside this chamber, Mr. Speaker. Completely and utterly inappropriate, Mr. Speaker. She should stop with the fear-mongering. I want to be very, very clear. The military is not being deployed into long-term care inside our province. 
the Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the presentation used to train the incoming military personnel warns that the nature and amount of death they may observe means they could experience what is called moral injury. This is defined as, quote, perpe perpe perpetrating, failing to prevent, or witnessing actions that violate deeply held moral beliefs. Then they identify PTSD as one condition that may arise. Why? On the very day we learn the military thinks PTSD is a likely outcome for all health care providers, are you jamming through legislation that would steal PTSD coverage from all Alberta health care workers? The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, again, the NDP are just making things up. Albertans deserve a heck of a lot better from the official opposition, Mr. Speaker, and they're going to get it from their government, Mr. Speaker. We're focused on lives and livelihoods, not playing politics like that, honourable member, not fear-mongering like the NDP continue to do inside this chamber, Mr. Speaker. The health minister and the premier are going to have more to say about this this afternoon, Mr. Speaker, but Alberta's government is going to take a reasonable approach, work with Albertans, focus on lives and livelihoods, Mr. Speaker, and again to the NDP, just stop fear-mongering. The leader of the official opposition. a public record outside of this building that records the facts. Yesterday, the Premier said a significant majority of people with COVID-19 are not sick. This statement is not only insensitive, it's not true and ignores that medical science is still determining the long-term impacts of this condition. The CDC, the WHO, the Mayo Clinic, Harvard Medicine and more have all found evidence of recurring or late symptoms as COVID impacts more than the lungs but also the heart and the brain. So Premier, you say these Albertans aren't sick but you're not a doctor, so clear this up. Who's right? The combined medical expertise of the world's leading health researchers or you? The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, COVID-19 is a very serious situation. The province of Alberta is in a state of emergency, Mr. Speaker. The Premier has in no way said that it is not serious. In fact, he's taken unprecedented steps, Mr. Speaker, to be able to help Albertans bend the curve, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue to do that. The NDP, unfortunately, though, just want to shut everything down and be damned with the consequences, Mr. Speaker. That is extraordinarily unfortunate. We're going to work again, Mr. Speaker, to protect lives and livelihoods, Mr. Speaker. We're not going to join the NDP in playing politics on this, and again to the Leader of the Official Opposition, shame on you. The Leader of the Official Opposition. Shame on the Government House Leader. Hansard said very clearly, the majority of Albertans will not get sick from COVID-19 who are infected. That's what the Premier said. Read the record. Quote, from January through March, it just felt like recurring exhaustion. They don't know how to get my breath back. That's Calgarian Cody Morash, who has had symptoms for nearly 11 months. Premier, are you telling these Albertans they're just not sick? You're the doctor. You know the medical evidence. You're right. And their symptoms are just pretend? I might remind the leader of the official opposition, no matter how passionate the question it is, it should go through the speaker, the government health leader. Mr. Speaker, what is a fact is that the majority of people who get, many of the people, I should say, Mr. Speaker, who get COVID-19 do not have symptoms, which is what the Premier was referring to. That does not mean that it is not a serious disease, Mr. Speaker, or may not have impact on those individuals, Mr. Speaker. Alberta's government is taking this very, very seriously, Mr. Speaker, putting in strong actions to be able to protect the citizens of this province, Mr. Speaker, and we're going to continue to focus on getting our province through this, protecting lives and livelihoods, Mr. Speaker, and the NDP playing politics over over and over and over in this chamber does not save one life. So again, to the Leader of the Official Opposition, shame on you. The Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, being Premier does not give one a medical license to play doctor. By saying the majority of Albertans get, quote, cold-like symptoms and they're not sick, the Premier is once again comparing COVID to the flu. It not only reveals his own personal prejudice against taking action, it's against everything. Dr. Hinshaw is pleading with Albertans to understand. It encourages people to ignore the rules, furthering the spread, putting more lives at risk. Will the Premier stand up, withdraw those comments, and apologize to Albertans for not taking this pandemic seriously? Seriously, as evidenced by his comments on the record in this house yesterday. The Honourable 
government house leader. Mr. Speaker, the opposition just proves the point over and over. All they can do is fear monger. The Premier is saying that many people do not have symptoms when they have COVID-19 or have cold-like symptoms, Mr. Speaker, does not mean that he's downplaying COVID-19, Mr. Speaker. That is completely and utterly ridiculous, Mr. Speaker. Uh, what needs to happen, Mr. Speaker, is the leader of the official opposition and her caucus should apologize to this chamber and should apologize to Albertans for continuing to play politics with people's lives, for continuing to fear monger, Mr. Speaker. Albertans are being a disservice from this official opposition. The order order. If the Honourable Member for Edmonton Whitemud would like to ask a question, I'm sure she can have an opportunity later, because the Honourable Member for Calgary Buffalo has the call. I won't hesitate to take further action to protect the citizens of Calgary. That was Mayor Nenshi's declaration yesterday as this Premier demonstrates a stunning lack of leadership to get control of this pandemic. We have a Premier who refuses to bring in a mask mandate as he cowers from his responsibilities. A Premier who refuses to discuss the R value because he won't ever admit he is wrong. We need a leader. To the Premier, when will you grow a backbone and get control of this pandemic? There goes the NDP again. They can't. All they can do, Mr. Speaker, is call names and, fe and fear-monger inside this place. Mr. Speaker, the Premier and the Health Minister have made significant steps along the way, Mr. Speaker, trying to be able to help our province get through this and to find balance while protecting lives and livelihoods, Mr. Speaker. And more of those steps will take place this afternoon. If the honourable members would like to know more about that, I encourage them to tune in to the Premier's press conference, Mr. Speaker. And in the meantime, stop fear-mongering and stop playing politics inside the chamber. The honourable member for Calgary Buffalo. Thank you. It's not just Calgary who sees a premier plagued by indecision and half measures. Edmonton Mayor Don Iveson says his city is, quote, on a collision course with calamity, end quote. The data has been clear for months, exponential growth in cases, hospitals overwhelmed, and people dying. And what do we see from the premier? A total abdication of leadership and a complete failure to plan for the second wave of this pandemic. To the premier, explain to Albertans why your COVID-19 containment strategy Strategy had been such a failure. How did you get it so wrong? COVID-19 numbers across the world are going up right now. This is an unprecedented problem that we are facing as a province. It should not be about politics. Unfortunately, we know with the NDP that's all they can do is play the politics of fear and smear. The Premier and this government have been making decisions along the way, Mr. Speaker, and they're going to make more decisions today. And I encourage the official opposition and all Albertans to tune in to the Minister of Health and the Premier's press conference today to learn more. Remember, Gary Buffalo. Leading, leading in the country in pandemic infections. One third of the population of Ontario. On November 23rd, the Premier got a letter from 341 doctors begging them to get control of this pandemic. It was the third urgent call for action, but the Premier couldn't summon the courage to lead. The doctors are leading, the mayors are leading, the military is leading, they're doing the round this government. It's a far cry from the spring when this Premier pretended he was the next incarnation of Winston Churchill. While the results are in, Mr. Speaker, no Winston Churchill on that side. You have failed Alberta workers, small businesses, seniors, school children. The Albertans Honourable the Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, you want to know who's failed Albertans? The official opposition, Mr. Here. Speaker, who at this point may be the worst official opposition in the history of this province, Mr. Speaker. Uh, that honourable member in particular, who we know already was the worst finance minister in the history of this province, Mr. Speaker, has now moved to the opposition benches to continue the behaviour that he had in government, which is to fearmonger and do nothing on behalf of the people of Alberta, Mr. Speaker, instead to play politics and practice the politics of fear and smear, Mr. Speaker. This side of the House is not going to do that. Shame on the NDP, Mr. Speaker. We're going to move forward for Alberta. A point of order has been noted at 2.04. Not sure why you remain standing. Order. The Honourable Member for Calgary Klein. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Small and medium-sized businesses have experienced an unprecedented loss in revenue due to COVID-19. That is why I was thankful that the Alberta government initiated the Small and Medium Enterprise Relaunch Grant, which promised much needed financial assistance to Alberta businesses and not-for-profits who were ordered to close or, or partially close, resulting in revenue to reductions of at least 40 percent. My question is the Minister of Jobs, Economy and Innovation. How much is Alberta's government allocated to this grant and how much will each applicant receive? 
The Honourable the Minister of Finance, President of the Treasury Board. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. Our government has allocated $200 million to the Small and Medium Enterprise Relaunch Grant Program, and as of yesterday, we've spent over $65 million of that budget. Each applicant is able to apply for up to $5,000, and understanding that the public health restrictions have been difficult for many small businesses, uh, we recently expanded the program, so those uh, that have already received the grant are going to be able to apply for a second grant of up to $5,000. Member for Calgary Klein. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for the answer. Given that the Alberta's government has committed $200 million uh, in funding for this program, and given that Alberta's government recognizes the negative impacts on, of, of health restrictions on business, and given that province uh, has recovered more than 247,000 of the 360,900 jobs lost between February and April this year, to the same Minister, how many businesses have applied for this grant in the first round of applications, and when will the second round open? The Honourable Minister of Finance, President of the Treasury Board. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. We've, we've seen more than 20,000 businesses apply for the Small and Medium Enter Enterprise Relaunch Grant in the first round of applications, and more than half of them received the full amount of $5,000. The second round of applications opens on Monday, and we're expecting that up to an additional 6,000 businesses will be eligible for the program due to the reduced revenue loss threshold of 40 per cent. Mr. Speaker, small businesses have been greatly challenged in this province, but I've been amazed at their innovative resilience and the way they have adjusted their operations to continue to serve Albertans. The Honourable Member for Calgary Klein. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, thank you to the Minister. Given Alberta's real GDP is expected to contract by 8.1 per cent, and given our government does not project a full recovery to 2019 levels of our real gross domestic product until 2023, and given that small and medium-sized businesses are essential to the economic growth and success of our provincial's COVID-19 recovery plan, can the minister please provide the projected benefits that programs such as the Small and Medium uh, Enterprise Relaunch Grant have on Alberta's economy? Honourable the Minister of Finance, President, Treasury Board. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Small and Medium Enterprise Relaunch Grant has been awarded to over 17,000 of our small businesses, giving them more than $65 million in support. Those businesses employ over 170,000 Albertans, Mr. Speaker, and they're using the grant to keep their doors open. Again, Mr. Speaker, I'm incredibly uh, proud and amazed at the innovative resilience of Alberta small businesses as they adjust their operations and continue to provide employment for tens of thousands of Albertans. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Millwoods has a question to ask. Mr. Speaker, the government has introduced time allocation motions on four pieces of legislation, including a bill that attacks worker safety during a pandemic. Given that we've only had one hour of debate on Bill 47 in committee, and given if that, that if this government provides us with the opportunity, we will have more than 25 amendments to improve this awful legislation, to the Minister of Labour and Immigration, if you are so proud of Bill 47, why have you laid the groundwork to jam it through the House and run away? The Honourable the Government House Leader. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. First of all, I would think the Deputy House Leader would know that there has not been a time allocation motion introduced to this House. Simply, there are time allocations on the order paper, Mr. Speaker, for one. Second, the Labour Bill, Mr. Speaker, is approaching the highest amount of any bill to be debated in this House. Uh, right now, up towards about two or three on the list of the 30th Legislature, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we have been encouraging the NDP to move their amendments for weeks. They have chosen to stall that piece of legislation on the second reading, Mr. Speaker. Considering they want to bring that up today through you, Mr. Speaker, to them, I strongly encourage them to get to work on their amendments because the House will complete its business, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable <coughs> Member for Edmonton Millwoods. Mr. Speaker, given that we would have brought forward amendments to protect workers from losing their jobs after filing a WCB claim, given we would have brought forward amendments to protect health benefits and compensation based on actual lost wages, given that we would like to seek to make clear the duties and responsibilities of officers, supervisors and others at a time when workers face COVID-related hazards every single day, to the same minister, why, in the middle of a pandemic, are you reducing safety, making access to WCB benefits harder and reducing the amounts of those benefits. 
The Honourable the Minister of Transportation and the Deputy Government House Leader. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a, it's a little rich from the uh, the folks across to complain at this point. You know what? We've been in the House for weeks. We've extended the session. We've extended the session by an extra week to give the opposition time to do what they got to do. Now they're complaining because the bill they think is the most important they haven't spent time on. They spent time on things that they think are less important, Mr. Speaker. They're so angry they weren't able to focus on what they think is most important. And now that their anger is catching up with them, they're trying to blame somebody else. They ought to take responsibility. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Millwoods. Given, I'm really sorry that this member wants to start his Christmas break on December 8th, and given that the amendment currently on the floor would protect frontline health care workers with presumptive PTSD coverage, something that is incredibly important given the state of what's happening in our continuing care centres and in our hospitals, and given that this government bragged in their fact sheets that this change will save them $230 million, to be very clear, saving money by denying workers coverage that they need to recover to the same minister. Will you commit to doing the right thing? Encourage all your colleagues to support our amendment. Government Health Leader. Mr. Speaker, if I was a stakeholder that that honourable member is worried about, I'd be very, very disappointed in the NDP because for several weeks they refused to get to work in committee of the whole on this important piece of legislation, Mr. Speaker. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, further to that, they have not shared any of their amendments with the government, Mr. Speaker. So clearly, they're not taking it very seriously, Mr. Speaker. That's disappointing. But, Mr. Speaker, there's still time. The legislature's still sitting, Mr. Speaker. So again, through you to them, we're starting to run out of chances, Mr. Speaker. But let's get to work on that legislation, because we will get Alberta's work Order, done. Order the Chief. Honourable Member for Edmonton Glenora, whether making a comment on the record or off the record, if the Speaker can hear it, it still remains unparliamentary. The Honourable Member for Edmonton City Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For months, we've been pressing this government for a provincial staffing strategy for seniors' facilities. But they did nothing but repeat empty talking points about working with operators, the same operators who just paid a rich dividend to their shareholders while COVID-19 ripped through their facilities and hundreds of Albertans died. Now we're deep into crisis, and this government is suddenly trying to panic hire 2,000 more people to take untrained jobs as comfort care aides. So how many lives have been lost in seniors' facilities? Why is, the pre why is the Minister of Health just starting to act now? The Honourable the Government Health Leader. Uh, Mr. Speaker, yet another ridiculous question from the NDP, who continue just to fearmonger inside this chamber, Mr. Speaker, through you to that Honourable Member, shame on you. We're proud of our Health Minister, who has worked tirelessly since COVID-19 arrived inside this country, Mr. Speaker. He's continuing to deal with an unprecedented situation, Mr. Speaker. And, Mr. Speaker, we will continue to take action to protect lives and livelihoods, Mr. Speaker. This government fully supports our Health Minister, Mr. Speaker. And stay tuned this afternoon to hear more about where Alberta is headed next. The Honourable Member for Edmonton City Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I will take no lectures from a minister with the Premier who built their careers on playing politics in fear and smear. Given seniors are suffering because nurses, health care aides, family members and volunteers are infected or forced into isolation. And given that continuing care in Alberta is 2,000 people short by the government's own admission. To the minister, you forced Alberta seniors to wait for months while you dithered and stood up for profitable corporations. What exactly is the job description for a comfort care aide? And when can we expect to see them arrive in seniors' facilities? One thing I can tell the member is that if he uses a preamble like that again, not in a round of the first four, we will be moving to the next questioner, the Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, again, most of that question is utterly false, Mr. Speaker, and continues with the fear-mongering, Mr. Speaker. Again, we're going to focus on live and livelihoods, Mr. Speaker, and I encourage the Honourable Member to stay tuned for what the Premier and the Health Minister have to say this afternoon. Honourable Member for Edmonton City Centre. Given, Mr. Speaker, that I would have loved to hear what the Minister of Health might say in question period, and given that trained health care aides have been working to exhaustion and beyond for months and putting themselves and their families at risk to serve seniors, and given that these heroes can make as little as $16 an hour in some facilities, and given that this government has robbed them of their federal wage top-up, again to the Minister. How much will the government of Alberta pay these untrained comfort care aides, and how quickly do they expect to hire 2,000 of them? The Honourable the Government House Leader has risen. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this government has invested over $170 million inside seniors' care, Mr. Speaker, during COVID-19. 
Mr. Speaker, again, uh, proving that this government is taking it seriously. We're going to continue to work with Albertans, Mr. Speaker. That is the way to get this province through it. The opposition's approach of playing fear and smear and politics with people's lives is not going to get it done, Mr. Speaker. But Albertans can rest assured the NDP is not in charge. This government will get it done. We'll stand with them and we're going to be able to get us through COVID-19. The Honourable Member for Livingston McLeod is next. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Earlier this summer, members of this Assembly passed a bill that would pro prohibit convicted sex offenders from changing their names. I'm proud that this government closed that loophole when it was discovered because our families should feel safe in their own neighbourhoods. However, last week I noticed that a dangerous offender in Edmonton is planning to apply for a legal name change, and that's concerning to me. To the Minister of Service Alberta, will the legislation you tabled earlier this year protect Albertans from dangerous offenders being allowed to legally change their names? Honourable the Minister of Service Alberta. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, earlier this year, to protect children and vulnerable Albertans, we made legislative changes that banned convicted sex offenders from legally changing their names. Today, there are no restrictions prohibiting dangerous offenders from being able to legally change their names, but we're going to change that. I'm very proud of the work that we've done to help Alberta families feel safer in their communities. They deserve to feel safe and confident that convicted sex offenders and other violent criminals are not hiding in our communities or hiding from their past. The Honourable Member for Livingston McLeod has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Given that only the worst of the worst criminals are given the designation of dangerous offender, and given that these vile criminals are not included in the amendments to the legislation and so still have the ability in Alberta to legally change their names, and given that ensuring the safety of Alberta families includes protecting them from hardened criminals who show no remorse, will the Minister consider expanding the scope of these amendments to prohibit dangerous offenders from being able to legally change their names? The Honourable Minister of Service Alberta. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. To say it simply, yes, absolutely. As I said earlier, this past summer we closed a loophole to prevent convicted sex offenders from being able to legally change their names. That was a first step. I will be reviewing this legislation to address this issue, and we will take action to prevent dangerous offenders from legally changing their names in the spring. Violent, dangerous offenders should have to live with their names just as the survivors of violent crimes live with their trauma for the rest of their lives. Honourable Member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. That's great news. Given that right now dangerous offenders can still apply to legally change their names, and given that in Edmonton the dangerous offender Leo Teske has made it clear that he wants to change his name and hide from his past and his convictions, and given that this represents a danger to adults, to children, law enforcement, all based on his criminal history, Again, to the Minister, what can be done to prevent this criminal from being able to change his name? The Honourable Minister of Service, Alberta. Well, Mr. Speaker, I was also concerned to hear that a monster like Leo Teske wants to change his name. But let me be clear that our vital statistics legislation provides the registrar with broad discretionary powers to refuse to register a legal change of name. The registrar has the authority to refuse to register a name on objectionable grounds, such as when the applicant has been convicted of a violent crime that threatened the lives, safety, or physical or mental well-being of others, or when the change of name would cause confusion or mislead the public in any way. I have confidence that Alberta's registrar has the tools needed to deny a legal change of name for individuals who are a danger to public safety. Mr. Edmonton White, not his next. Since the pandemic began, Albertans have been asking for safeguards to protect our children. Instead, the UCP has provided no financial support, weak leadership, half-hearted guidance for schools and childcare, and a premier who tells the province, don't worry, because only your grandparents will die of COVID-19. Schools reopened unsafely, and thousands of children and families have been rotating through repeated isolation and doing their own contact tracing. Children are getting sick and spreading COVID. Nearly 15,000 children in Alberta have had COVID, including over 2,000 under the age of five. To the Premier, why did your government downplay the risks of COVID-19 to our children? The Honourable the Minister of Children's Services. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I certainly would hope that as a former public servant, the member opposite would respect uh, those public servants who are working hard every day to keep Albertans safe, including the Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Dina Hinshaw, who I truly do believe is the best, best Chief Medical Officer of Health we have in Canada. Sure. Uh, we have continued to follow her guidance. Uh, that is why we've seen um, four out of five of all schools have no cases, and we remain um, keeping child care, preschools, out-of-school care open based on her guidance and um, what she's seeing in terms of cases and best practices and research around the world. The Honourable Member for Edmonton-Oymud. 
there are outbreaks at most hospitals in the province, and given that AHS is considering treating adults at Alberta's children's hospitals due to the government's mismanagement of the second wave, and given children's hospitals in Ontario are overwhelmed, leaving over 700 families that are waiting for children's health services such as wheelchair fittings, autism supports, and surgeries, to the Minister of Health, if Ontario is delaying children's health services and you're preparing for field hospitals, what is the state of children's health in our province? How many pediatric surgeries and appointments have been delayed, and how many children's lives have you put at risk? The Honourable the Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, it's disappointing to see the Honourable Member go and use fear-mongering on what is such an important question, Mr. Speaker. First of all, uh, we're not bringing in field hospitals at the moment, Mr. Speaker. We're working hard to be able to uh, deal with COVID-19 inside our province, Mr. Speaker. And again, Mr. Speaker, simply the Health Minister and the Premier will have more to say this afternoon, and the Honourable Member should stop fear-mongering and do her job as a member of the official opposition and ask reasonable questions, Mr. Speaker, and stop playing politics with a pandemic. The Honourable Member. Well, given that that answer indicates that children's health is not a priority for this, minister, for this minister or this government, and given that 19 children under the age of five have been hospitalized, three in ICUs, and 38 children between the ages of five and 19 have been hospitalized, five in ICU, and given these children and their families are going through hell as these kids gasp for air and beg for their mom or dad, who can't be there because of quarantine or, or restrictions on visitation, to the Premier, what will it take for this government to take COVID seriously and protect the lives of children? A child dies as a result of COVID-19 in Winnipeg last week. Is that what it will take before you'll take our children's health seriously? The Honourable the Minister of Children's Services. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I would say that obviously the death of any Albertan as a result of COVID-19 is something that we take incredibly seriously in this House. Mr. Speaker, unlike the members opposite, we're going to continue to take the advice of officials like the Chief Medical Officer of Health. We think she's doing an exceptional job. Unlike the members opposite as well, we're not going to speculate. Um, we are going to also balance um, the excellent advice that we receive. Uh, I would encourage the members opposite to take a step back from the politics, to stop creating fear, and to recognize that we also want to um, balance lives and livelihoods as we navigate this pandemic. Together. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Glenora has the call. It's government in action that's creating fear. Alberta hit another grim milestone yesterday. More than 1,000 schools have sent home notices of COVID-19 cases. On the same day, the UCP decided to bend the rules on who's considered a close contact in school. Now, teachers have to try to recall how many minutes they spend close to people infected with the virus. Are you kidding me? This is a ridiculous policy, and it's a clear admission by this government that they don't understand the realities of classrooms or of COVID. Why does a minister make Alberta school, why won't she make Alberta schools safer? instead of dropping safety standards in schools. The Honourable Minister of Children's Services. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And again, the member opposite, as the former uh, Minister of Health, would understand how these things work, that we do take the advice of health officials. And that's exactly what happened here. So, Mr. Speaker, um, these processes and assessments of who is a contact is being refined so that teachers are not being forced to quarantine unnecessarily. Previously, AHS contact investigation within schools regarded anyone in a classroom with an infectious case to be a close contact, and then were required to quarantine, Mr. Speaker. This was resulting in many teacher staff being excluded when they may not have actually had close contact with a student case. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Glenora. Given that the tapes clearly state otherwise, and given that contact tracing in Alberta schools has been completely collapsed, and that has been the work dumped onto educators now because the government has failed to provide appropriate supports, and given that the latest absurd idea from this government is that students and staff somehow run around classrooms with 40 stop watches around their necks trying to keep track of how much time they spend sitting close to each other, when will this government stop reading those ridiculous notes and act in the best interest of students and cap class sizes? Enough excuses! Mr. Speaker, once again, the plan that the members opposite continue to criticize was developed by the Minister of Education in partnership with school divisions across the province, as well as the Chief Medical Officer of Health. Absolutely, the increase in COVID-19 cases has impacted contact tracing. That is why AHS has put a priority on school-aged children to get information to schools and families faster. They're also wor working to double their contact tracing teams to have more than 1,600 staff doing this tracing by the end of the year. I, for one, Mr. Speaker, I am grateful by the work being done by Alberta Health and AHS officials on this front. The Honourable Member. Given that it's 
parents and principals that are forced to do the contract tracing, and given that hundreds of thousands of Alberta students have already been forced to abandon their classrooms because this government chose to prioritize a $4.7 billion corporate giveaway over capping class sizes, Mr. Speaker. And given, it's not a laughing matter, members. And given that the government has now compromised the safety of kindergarten to grade six students and staff by abandoning public health guidance, why is the Minister of Education so afraid to sit in this room and answer questions, but she thinks it's safe for children to sit in classrooms and keep track of how many of them have been exposed to COVID? A point of order is noted at 2.24. The Honourable Member. Safe because AHS and the schools are doing an excellent job of protecting students and keeping families informed. Mr. Speaker, I know this. As a parent of a kindergarten child in a school, I see how these protocols are followed every single day. Mr. Speaker, transmission in schools is also low. low. Four out of five of all schools have had no cases, Mr. Speaker. In-school transmission has occurred in only one of eight schools, and just 1.1% of COVID cases since September have been acquired through in-school transmission. We are going to continue to work with our school division partners with schools and with AHS and Alberta Health uh, to keep kids and staff safe. The Honourable Member for Lacombe Panoke is the only one with the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, the Minister of Service Alberta announced changes to Alberta's license plates. I'm excited to see a move to get rid of the annual expiry stickers and catch up with other jurisdictions with reflective plates means that our license plates will be modernized. I've received some questions from Albertans, though, that I'd like the Minister to answer. Minister. What is a reflective plate, and what will the new place look like? Order, order. The Honourable Minister of Service, Alberta. Mr. Speaker, uh, it's a good question. It's one I've heard from a lot of Albertans since we made this announcement this week. So first of all, let me be perfectly clear. These new plates will look exactly the same. The design is not changing. What is changing is we are moving to reflective plates. And what's exciting about these new plates is that they have enhanced security measures, which will prevent, uh, prevent fraudulent use of fake plates. Um, and it's also going to make them more visible, which is going to be great for law enforcement uh, as they are keeping our roads safe. Honourable Member for Lacombe Panoka. Thank you, Minister. Uh, given a change to reflective plates, seems like it will probably cost more money. Mm -hmm. And given that many Albertans prefer to keep their plates for years, even decades, rather than replace them every year, yep. and there are millions of Albertans affected by this change, can you please tell us how much it will cost to renew a vehicle registration in 2021 and how the plate replacement will work? The Honourable Minister of Service, Alberta. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to report that there will be no change in cost to Albertans when they are registering their vehicle, renewing their registration, uh, or when they are uh, purchasing a new plate. Uh, if they are purchasing a plate today, it will be the same price as when they purchase a plate next year with the new reflective plates. Uh, also, I'd like to clarify that no Albertan will be forced to change their plate. If you have a plate today and you want to keep it, you can keep it. But starting next year in, in, the, in the fall, when you do choose to get a brand new plate, you will be getting a reflective plate at the same cost as any plate you had purchased before. The Honourable Member for La Companoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and that's great news. Given the Minister has said that a change to reflective plates enables the use of better technology, and given that Alberta drivers and law enforcement are much more used to the current system that includes a visible sticker at the bottom of their plates, can the Minister explain what this technology is and how does it work? The Honourable Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, what, what we are seeing around the world is a move by law enforcement to adopt more technology and innovative approaches to doing their job. And one of the ways that they do that is by using automated license plate reader technology. And those, those uh, license plate readers read the whole plate and can integrate with our, our databases to, to determine whether that plate represents a vehicle that's properly registered. Uh, so the, uh, the move to reflective plates is more visible, is more compatible with these new technologies. It will enable law enforcement to move forward with more innovative approaches as they work so hard to keep Albertans safe. The order, the Honourable Member for Edmonton South. Edmonton's Chinese community is reeling during this COVID-19 pandemic. The outbreak in the Edmonton Chinatown Care Centre is still out of control, and yesterday, tragically, six more residents died as a result of this virus. My heart goes out to those families that have lost loved ones. Even with this unspeakable tragedy, we are hearing that little has changed. Family members still are coming in to provide care for their loved ones because of the lack of staff, and, and COVID-19 continues to spread. To the Minister, the residents, staff and families need help now. What is being done to control the outbreak? 
How many more people have to get sick or before real action will be taken, like hiring more staff and rapid testing? The Honourable, the Government House Leader. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. More than $260 million has been invested for safety measures at long-term care, designated supportive living facilities and senior lodges. That funding, Mr. Speaker, is retroactive to March and will continue into 2021. Mr. Speaker, that funding is for enhanced staffing, cleaning supplies, supplies, revenue loss, and the cost of additional precautions if the outbreak occurs and or continues inside facilities like this, Mr. Speaker. Again, the Health Minister will have some more actions that are also taking place across this province with the Premier this afternoon. I encourage the member to stay tuned for that press conference. The Honourable Member for Edmonton South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Given that those communities need help now, and given that the Edmonton Chinatown is an interconnected community, and that the outbreak in the Chinatown Care Centre impacts the community beyond just its walls, and given that Chinatown businesses are already seeing the impact of the outbreak in the surrounding community, Tom Lai, owner of Dynasty Restaurant, says that all of Chinatown is feeling the impact of the outbreak. And quote, once the news hit and said there was an outbreak at Chinatown Seniors Home, that people automatically think it's the whole Chinatown. Then people stay away from the area, end quote. To the Premier, do you realize your failure to protect seniors in the Chinatown Care Centre has had a staggering impact on Chinatown small businesses as well? The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, again, uh, significant action are being taken when it comes to, to seniors care inside the province and will continue. Uh, Alberta Health and AHS are also actively inspecting continuing care facilities all across the province. On-site visits include observations of scre screening processes, infection prevention and control practices, uh, COVID-19 outbreak implementation and enhanced cleaning plans. Mr. Speaker, Alberta Health and AHS follow up on deficiencies noted at facilities and conduct monitoring visits to ensure full compliance. Mr. Speaker, again, $260 million have been invested for safety measures at long-term care, Mr. Speaker, and this government will continue to work with facilities all across the province to protect our most vulnerable. The Honourable Member. Given that Edmonton's Chinatown is fighting against racism, xenophobia and misinformation that is fueling boycotts, vandalism uh, and even violent attacks against Asian Albertans and Chinese-owned businesses, and given that this UCP caucus has clearly bought into this misinformation with the Ministry of Infrastructure claiming that I personally knew where COVID-19 came from because I am of Chinese descent, and this Premier's failure to immediately call out the anti-mask protesters where known racist groups like the Proud Boys were spreading false information. To the Premier, will you admit that you and your caucus members' actions have amplified racist sentiment and commit immediately to no longer fueling the misinformation that is destroying the our The Honourable people. the Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, uh, that is ridiculous. This government condemns any and all racism, Mr. Speaker. That is very, very clear, Mr. Speaker. What is not clear, actually what is clear, Mr. Speaker, is the official opposition and that member who is part of a government caucus who admitted that there, there were investigations done into serious sexual assault issues within their caucus, Mr. Speaker, and were able to find out and confirm that several of those issues had actually taken place and have remained quiet, Mr. Speaker. Does that honourable member know who it is, Mr. Speaker? I do not. We will not be lectured by that honourable member when it comes to how they manage their caucus inside this place, Mr. Speaker. The honourable member for Edmonton Goldbar is next. Last week, Albertans learned that the government is starting to offer coal leases for about 2,000 hectares of land on Alberta's eastern slopes, conveniently right after the Grassy Mountain coal hearings closed. Yeah. The government was quick to tell Albertans that potentially devastating coal mine projects in the area haven't been approved yet, hardly reassuring, given that the government rescinded Premier Lougheed's coal policy without even talking to Albertans. Minister, we all see where this is headed. Why can't you just admit that your grand plan is to proliferate coal mining and destroy our pristine landscapes? The Honourable the Government Health Leader. Mr. Speaker, again, the NDP uh, continue to make things up. First of all, the Grassy Project, Mr. Speaker, was taking place underneath that member and the former government, Mr. Speaker. Second of all, uh, these leases that are in question, Mr. Speaker, the honourable member is referring to have nothing to do with the former 1976 coal policy, Mr. Speaker. They're actually in what are called Category 2 lands and would have not been imp uh, wouldn't impacted by that coal policy, Mr. Speaker. Again, no coal mine has been approved inside this area. Both the federal and the provincial regulator make sure that the strict environmental rules that come to coal development, Mr. Speaker, are in place and they will continue to do so. The honourable member for Edmonton Gold Bar. Well, given Category 2 lands used to prevent uh, open pit mining, and given that government is already pushing for more industrial use in the Old Man watershed, and given that we've already seen the negative effects on watersheds in the BC portion of that, river, uh, of that valley, and given that the Old Man watershed could be used to enable other industrial uses or protect drinking water in southern Alberta, and given that there are already a number of coal projects in the area, to the Minister of Environment and Parks, how can you expect Albertans to trust you with protecting our drinking water? 
The Honourable the Minister of Environment and Pests. Speaker, how can Albertans take anything that Honourable Member says when his questions are could have, they might, I don't know if it's taking place, but it could have, Mr. Speaker. The conspiracy theories from the Honourable Member from Goldbar are completely and utterly ridiculous. Again, the regulatory regime is in place for the Alberta Energy Regulator and the Federal Regulator when it comes to coal, Mr. Speaker. All environmental rules continue to be followed, Mr. Speaker. And in fact, I was proud to sign ministerial orders that protected Category 1 lands all across the province from coal development, Mr. Speaker. Again, the Honourable Member, please stop fear-mongering inside the Assembly. The Honourable Member. Uh, given that the people of BC full, know full well the water impacts on mining, and given that global steelmakers are looking at replacing coke and coal in their steelmaking process, and given that steel production growth is predicted to level out in 2025, long before any of these coal projects would even come online, and given that the government's diversification is a luxury approach to economic development has so far failed to deliver for Albertans. And given that we saw before the pandemic this government lose 50,000 jobs, to the Minister, why does your economic plan revolve around dabbling in 19th century industries like coal mining? The Honourable the Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, continuing to watch uh, the NDP attack the hardworking people that work within the coal industry, both inside our province and outside the province, is disappointing, Mr. Speaker. Again, I want to be very clear. All environmental rules remain in place inside the eastern slopes, and they will remain in place inside the eastern slopes, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member can't even ask a question inside this chamber without notes and cannot even adjust his questions when he finds out the things that he's saying are factually wrong, Mr. Speaker. Again, we will not be lectured by an Honourable member that wished Margaret Thatcher dead, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Highwood. Mr. Speaker, skills trades are a vital part of Alberta and the road to recovery will hinge on having a strong skills trades workforce. Without them, cars don't run, buildings aren't built or maintained, and even our hair doesn't get cut. That's why on our election platform we committed to recognizing that a skills trade is as valuable as a degree. So to the Minister of Advanced Education, how are tradespeople like myself in Alberta being recognized for the hard work that they do? The Honourable the Minister of Children's Services. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for his important question. Just last week, Alberta's government was proud to announce the first ever inductees into the Alberta Trades Hall of Fame. The Alberta Trades Hall of Fame recognizes and honours individuals who have made exceptional contributions to advancing the skilled trades, mentoring students, and to supporting the success of others, and this year's inductees have done that and more. From founding Women Building Futures to introducing heavy vehicle technology to the world stage, each inductee has been a trailblazer for trades and apprenticeship education. Mr. Speaker, skilled tradespeople matter. These professionals and educators help build our province. They help keep it moving forward, and they deserve to be recognized. Honourable Member for Highwood. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that answer. Given that the value of our tradespeople often goes overlooked, and since the Skilled Trades Hall of Fame is dedicated to honouring those that have contributed to Alberta's successes, and given that it's a vital part of the province's robust skills for jobs plan to enhance apprenticeship, can the minister please tell Albertans about some of the individuals selected for induction into the Hall of Fame for this year? The Honourable Minister of Children's Services. Quote, I think education is a great equalizer of opportunity. To me, it is a fundamental requirement for us to move our economy ahead. End quote. Mr. Speaker, that is a direct quote from one of this year's inductees and speaks to the character of each individual inducted into the Trades Hall of Fame. These are extraordinary people who have made lasting impacts on their profession, their communities, and most importantly, on future trades workers. On behalf of Alberta's government, I'd like to congratulate Judy Lynn Archer, Herman Bruin, Doug Golosky, Bobby Haraba and Eric Newell on their well-earned induction into the Alberta Trades Hall of Fame. The Honourable Member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again to the Minister. Considering, considering many may realize a lifelong passion in the trades, and given that many young people may not be aware of the opportunities presented through a career in a skilled trade, or even that being a part of the Skills Trades Hall of Fame is even possible. Can the Minister inform us on how people can nominate the Hall of Fame and what criteria they should meet? 
Minister of Children's Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Each day, Alberta's diverse, intelligent, skills, trades, professional, and educators get to work building our province and supporting our communities. Mr. Speaker, I want to encourage anyone who knows someone who has made significant contributions to the skill, trades, or apprenticeship education to nominate them for the Alberta Trades Hall of Fame. Mr. Speaker, nomination packages can be found online at www.alberta.ca slash ATHOF nomination and submitted throughout the year. The annual deadline to submit nominations is March 1st. The Honourable Member for Fort Saskatchewan Vegreville has a question. Mr. Speaker, recently the Minister of Infrastructure announced a new public-private partnership framework, an unsolicited proposal framework and guidance. It is intended to help Albertans, Alberta's government find alternate ways to build infrastructure, create jobs and stimulate the economy, while making the most of limited taxpayer dollars. While sounding promising, these frameworks are quite technical. To the Minister of Infrastructure, in layman's terms, what does the P3 framework and the USP framework mean? The Honourable the Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, uh, given that Alberta's uh, recovery plan is needed to boost our economy and get it back on track, and given that Alberta's recovery plan is focused on creating jobs while investing back into our province, the uh, Minister of Infrastructure had mentioned that these frameworks will be part of Alberta's economic recovery uh, by providing new ways to get infrastructure built, even when we weren't expecting it. We're going to actually listen to the ideas of Albertans. The Honourable Member for Fort Saskatchewan, Vangerville. Mr. Speaker, given that Alberta's recovery plan is needed to boost our economy and get it back on track, and given that Alberta's recovery plan is focused on creating jobs while in investing back into our province, and given that the Minister had mentioned that these frameworks will be part of Alberta's economic recovery, to the same Minister, how do these frameworks fit in your recovery plan? Honourable Minister of Transportation. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Through the uh, Minister of Infrastructure, these frameworks support Alberta's economic recovery by demonstrating our commitment to attracting private sector investment, investment that will help launch much-needed public infrastructure, create jobs, and stimulate the economy for all Albertans. There's a dirty little secret the NDP doesn't like to talk about. They don't have a plan when it comes to building infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. They would either have to raise tra taxes or drive us even further into debt because they really hate the word private in public-private partnerships. We, on the other hand, are prepared to work with everybody to get the infrastructure built that Albertans need. The Honourable Member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and to the Minister for his answer. Given that the P3 framework and the USP framework will provide government greater flexibility to deliver infrastructure, while encouraging the private sector to come forward with solutions to help provide infrastructure, and given that infrastructure can mean a wide variety of projects that our province needs. To the same minister, can you clarify what kind of projects can be built using the same framework? The Minister of Transportation. Well, Mr. Speaker, that's a great question. And here's the interesting thing. Since it's an unsolicited proposal, we actually, in most cases, won't know till it comes in. The, the, uh, these frameworks will, uh, however, attract private sector investment. We invite the private sector to come forward with their ideas and their innovation, whether it's for a highway, a bridge, a transit project, a hospital, a school, an irrigation system, Mr. Speaker. The, the, it's up to the imagination of the world out there. Alberta's government will listen with, and use our successful track record in delivering P3s and other ways of building much-needed infrastructure. And, Mr. Speaker, we will do it in partnership with the private sector, in partnership with Albertans using their great ideas. Honourable members, prior to us returning to um, the remainder of the routine and providing you 35 seconds notice uh, that we will be doing that, I would like to make just one brief announcement that I think each of us should be very proud of. Uh, I, the announcement this afternoon, it's come to my attention that two of our young Legislative Assembly empo employees have been selected to participate in the prestigious Commonwealth Youth Parliament. This year's session will be held virtually next week and over 50 young people from around the world have been participated or have been are expected to participate and have been selected alongside young members of parliament of the commonwealth parliamentary association branches it's an opportunity for young people from the commonwealth to experience aspects of parliamentary democracy and procedure they will also convene in a new and innovative setting that reflects the measures that many parliaments have also taken during the covid-19 pandemic Formal parliamentary practices adopted from several Commonwealth countries, virtual responses to the pandemic will follow, be followed in the proceedings and observed under the watchful eyes of experienced parliamentarian officials. I'd like to congratulate Rebecca Hicks, Venue Services Assistant and former Page, 
currently attending the U of A Bachelor of Arts, Combined Honours in History and English, and Maria Overdrenjko, an input editor, former Page, Alberta Hansard, third year U of A Political Science. It's a very prestigious award. I thought it was of note to be able to congratulate them from the assembly. I'm sure all members will join me in congratulating them. In 30 seconds or less, we will proceed to the remainder of the daily routine. for Fort Saskatchewan, Vegreville has a statement to make. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It, was an, it is an honour to serve the amazing constituents of Fort Saskatchewan, Vegreville. Families and businesses in my riding have shown tremendous strength and courage in the face of this pandemic, and they have great hope for the future. After meeting with the people in my riding and hearing their hope, it's always jarring to come to the chamber and listen to the opposition spread, spread fear and negativity. Of course, this is nothing new. Over the past 19 months, I've sat in this chamber many times and listened to the members opposite say many things, whether true or not, scaring Albertans. Somehow their decorum has gone from bad to worse, to now being a daily onslaught of fear, negativity and information. This reminds me of the kids I went to school in junior high with. Kids who followed, kids who heckled, kids who bullied. And because they had nothing constructive to say or do. My mom told me these kids would eventually grow up. Boy, was she wrong. What the opposition needs to understand is that Albertans are hopeful people. This Christmas season, I have some reflections on hope that I would like to share. Hope is not a feeling, it's a path. We have all faced difficult moments, moments that try the human soul and feel impossible. But hope sees the invisible, feels the intangible, and achieves the impossible. The story of our province is a story of hope, a story of people who have accomplished impossible things, like separating oil from sand, setting off the greatest prosperity boom our country has ever seen. Even in these trying times, Albertans believe in themselves and the province we love and call home. Our government spreads that message of hope every day, even through the darkest times. We introduce legislation that will make Albertans' lives better and easier. We propose common sense solutions for Alberta's economic recovery. Mr. Speaker, on this side of the aisle, we are hopeful for the future, and we will be the leaders Albertans elected us to be. Presenting reports by standing and special committees. Presenting petitions. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Riverview has a petition. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm uh, proud to on behalf of the Families Advocating for Compassionate Elder Care, also known as FACE, uh, to uh, table this petition with almost 5,000 signatures asking for compassionate care ratios, accountability and regulations, and affordable and compassionate care alternatives for uh, the elder care system in our province. So I have the requisite copies. I appreciate the Honourable Member uh, in her presentation of a petition. I'm not sure if it uh, was approved through Parliamentary Council, which would make it an uh, official petition. If it hasn't been, we will accept it as a tabling, uh, which would take place in tabling returns and reports, but given that you've tabled it now, it's fine. We'll accept it as a tabling if it, not, if it isn't technically a petition, but just wanted to put that on the record uh, for you and the signatories. Notices of motions, introduction of bills. The Honourable Member for Brooks, Medicine Hat. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I request leave to introduce a bill being the Municipal Government Firearms Amendment Act 2020. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this bill is uh, my private member's bill this, this session. I'm one of uh, probably very few members in the province who've actually got to table two private member's bills in one sitting, um, thanks to the Bill 206 as well. But this bill itself um, will enshrine our, our government's commitment, my commitment personally, to ensuring that firearms owners are protected in this province. We know that Justin Trudeau is after uh, legally acquired property property in this province and we will not let him have that in our municipalities and we will make sure that the government of Alberta um, has the final say in, uh, in what's going on here. So Mr. Speaker, I am very proud to table this bill and I will do so now. Uh, 
perhaps you might say you're very honored to move first reading as opposed to... Very honored to move first reading of Bill 211, uh, the Municipal Government Firearms Amendment Act 2020. Honorable members, the member for Brooks Medicine Hat has moved first reading of Bill 211, Municipal Government Firearms Amendment Act 2020. Does the Assembly agree to the motion for first reading? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. In my opinion, the ayes have it. That motion is carried and so ordered. Bill 211, Municipal Government Firearms Amendment Act 2020 is now read a first time. The Honourable Member for Calgary North. Speaker, I am so honoured and pleased to move the first reading of Private Member Bill 212, the Official Sport of Alberta Act. This bill would make Rodeo Alberta's official sport. Mr. Speaker, I have had the opportunity to live in rural Alberta some 40 plus years ago in conjunction with my oil and gas work. Here I learned and experienced rich rural culture, a culture of hospitality, generosity, cooperation and collaboration, with rodeo being the most favoured sport. The rodeo is an important thread in the rich cultural fabric of our province. The rodeo is, the rodeo is about competition, entertainment, music, and of course, the food. But I know that at its heart, Mr. Speaker, rodeo is about community. It's about bringing together people from all walks of life, all different backgrounds, immigrants like myself, or people who have been here in Alberta for generations like yourself. Our love for rodeo is something we share as Albertans, and I want that to be officially recognized in legislation. As a proud Calgarian, I was deeply saddened that the iconic Calgary Stampede had to be cancelled this year. I know I share this with many Albertans as other rodeos across the province were also cancelled. I hope this bill will be a small beacon of hope for Albertans as we end this challenging year 2020 and serve as a reminder that we have much to look forward to Yahoo, Mr. Speaker! I see the Honourable Member for Calgary North has taken first reading speech lessons from the Honourable Minister of Immigration and Labour. The Honourable Member for Calgary North has moved first reading of Bill 212, Official Sport of Alberta Act. Does the Assembly agree to the motion? If so, please say aye. aye. Any opposed, please say no. In my opinion, the ayes have it. That motion is carried and so ordered. Bill 212, Official Sport of Alberta Act, is now read a first time. Tabling returns and reports. Honourable Members, for clarity's sake, the Honourable Member for Edmonton uh, Riverview earlier rose on a tabling returns and petitions that has not been accepted as a petition, but has been accepted as a tabling. The Honourable Minister of Service Alberta, followed by the M Member for Edmonton Millwoods. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today in accordance with Section 86 of the FOIP Act to table the requisite five copies of the FOIP Act Annual Report for 2019-2020. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Millwoods. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to table five copies of uh, draft uh, potential amendments to Bill 47. Uh, just interested, interested in adding these to the record and the debate. Uh, through tabling's returns and reports. Uh, these are drafts, uh, and this was discussed with the table. Uh, are there other tablings? Seeing none. Tablings to the clerk. Honourable members, we are at, oh, a tabling. The tablings to the clerk are uh, placed in the clerk's mailbox outside of the regular function of session, of which, of course, you're more than welcome to do uh, following the proceedings today, because currently we are at points of order, and the I couldn't agree more. The Honourable, the Government House Leader, Rose, uh, on a point, oh, a correction, I believe the Honourable Member for Carson Siksika rose on the first point of order today at approximately 2.03. The Honourable Member for Carson Siksika. 
Well, I thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate you acknowledging uh, me and uh, this point of order that I raised at the time that you had mentioned. I rise on point of order 23J, uses abusive or insulting language of a nature likely to create disorder. At that time, when the point of order was called, the member from Edmonton White Mud clearly said to the Minister uh, of, um, Minister of um, <laughs> Environment and Parks and Sundry's favorite son, Mr. Speaker, you're an embarrassment. Now, you have already talked a lot about the use of words, and in some cases, in some contexts, they are parliamentary, in other cases, they are not. This, in my opinion, Mr. Speaker, is a point of order. It is language that is abusive, meant to cause disorder. Uh, frankly, the only embarrassment here is the conduct of the NDP in their attempt to politicize the pandemic. And, Mr. Speaker, this is not the first time the member from Edmonton White Mud has spent time in the point of order penalty box, and she's even spent some time in the point of privilege purgatory. So it shouldn't be that difficult for that member to, frankly, simply withdraw, apologize, and improve that member's own decorum in this chamber. The Honourable the Member for Edmonton Millwoods. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, under this point of order uh, that has been raised under 23J, uh, I certainly did not hear the member uh, make any of those statements. I did, however, hear the minister say that we are an embarrassment, that we should be ashamed. Uh, in fact, he specifically told the leader of the official opposition, you should be ashamed, uh, speaking to her directly. Uh, and I believe he also referred to the worst finance minister in history. Uh, so I would argue, Mr. Speaker, this is not a point of order. There was rigorous debate happening here in this House, and although the government seems to be particularly thin-skinned today, uh, I would argue this was not a point of order, but rather a matter of debate that is critically important given the state of the pandemic in our province. Honourable Members, uh, unless there is other submissions, I am prepared to rule. I do also have the benefit of uh, the Blues. Um, uh, the Honourable the Minister, the Government House Leader, approximately uh, shortly before 2-3, said, Mr. Speaker, you want to know who's failed Albertans? Now, all members of the Assembly will know that it is difficult for the Speaker to comment on uh, comments made off the record that were not um, picked up by the Blues or by Hansard. However, in this case, the Honourable Member for Edmonton, White Mud, interjected with, you're the government, start acting like it. The minister continued, the official opposition, who at this point may be the worst official opposition in the history of this province, that member in particular, who we know is already the worst finance minister in the province of Alberta history, the member for uh, Calgary Buffalo interjected with, you've got him, right beside you, the minister proceeded. He's now moved to the opposition benches to continue the behavior like he had in government, which is fear-mongering and doing nothing on behalf of the people of Alberta and instead to practice uh, and play politics of fear and smear. The Honourable Member for Calgary Buffalo, Deficit Leader, the Honourable Member for Edmonton White Mud, perhaps honourable in this use, uh, is maybe not ideal. You're an embarrassment. Uh, the Honourable Minister continued, this side of the House is not going to do that. Shame on the NDP, Mr. Speaker. We're going to move forward on Albertans. Point of order was called. I would suggest that uh, all members will know that on page 6, 19 of House of Commons Procedures and Practice, it states the following. Remarks which question a member's integrity, honesty, and character are not in order. A member will be requested to withdraw offensive remarks, allegations, or accusations of 620 impropriety directed towards a member. I think it's reasonable. Given the evidence of the blues that the Honourable Min Member for Edmonton Millwoods uh, will withdraw the remarks on behalf of the Honourable Member for Edmonton Mill, uh, Edmonton White Mud, making statements like you're an embarrassment is unparliamentary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On behalf of the member from Edmonton White Mud, I withdraw. The, I don't need any help from the member for Carson Siksika boasting or gloating about how many points of order he may or may not won. It's certainly not uh, behavior becoming of a 
deputy government whip. The second point of order was called by the government house leader. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I rise on the point of order. I'll refer you to House of Commons Procedures and Practice, third edition. Uh, 147, where it refers to allusion to the presence of absence of a member or minister in the chamber are unacceptable. Speakers have upheld this prohibition on the grounds that there are many places that members have to be in order to carry out all their obligations that go with their office. Mr. Speaker, I would also point out that uh, the need for members to be in other places at this moment is even more because of the pandemic. Uh, you can look across this room right now, Mr. Speaker, and we are not sitting in normal spots. We are having to go out of our way to space between each other. Both the official opposition, I thank them for that, as well as the government are taking great steps to do that. The reality of that is that you cannot bring every minister into the chamber, even if every minister was available. Uh, that's what we've agreed to, to keep people safe for the pandemic. The member from Edmonton Gold, no, sorry, Glenora, uh, said in her question at that time, referred to the absence, first of all, of the minister. Second, uh, said that she was scared to be in the chamber to answer questions. I will point out to you that the Honourable Education Minister is certainly not scared of anybody. I've known her a long time. She has been in this chamber many times to answer questions repeatedly over the last uh, two years and will be back as well, Mr. Speaker. But referring in any way or even alluding to the fact that she is absent from this chamber is certainly out of order, Mr. Speaker. And again, I want to reiterate, it's certainly, in my view, double inappropriate when this House is working together to create space to keep all members safe, Mr. Speaker, uh, because the reality is that not all members of Cabinet can be inside this chamber. The Honourable Member from Edmonton Millwoods. Much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I rise on this point of order to suggest that this is not a point of order, but rather a matter of debate. Uh, the topic at hand was capping class sizes. Uh, and in this case, uh, the government House Leader has, has simply pointed out that we have capped the size of the class here in the legislature. Uh, and the member from Edmonton Glenora was simply referring to that. That being said, I, I will defer to your ruling, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the comments by both uh, the government house leader and the deputy opposition house leader. Um, I want to make something perfectly clear to members of the assembly that I take no pleasure in calling members individually or collectively to order. In fact, the very best house for uh, a speaker in our system is one in which they are not needed or at least not called upon to call members to order. And so on a number of occasions, I felt it necessary to call members of the House to order today. Um, sometimes that's on the government side and regularly it's on the opposition side. It is important to note that I take no pleasure in doing that and I would prefer the alternative arrangements to be made. The uh, Honourable Member for Edmonton Glenora made this statement. The minister, why is the minister so afraid to sit in this room and answer questions? It certainly implies that she is not in this room, which is a point of order, and the honourable member uh, can withdraw her remarks and uh, we can consider this matter dealt with and concluded. I'm happy to do so, Mr. Speaker, withdrawn and apologize. Honourable members, appreciate the uh, prompt apology. I consider this matter dealt with and concluded which brings us to orders of the day, orders du jour. Government motions, motion number 53, Honourable Mr. Nixon. The Honourable, the Government House Leader has the call. Mr. Speaker, before I move a Government Motion uh, 53, I would like to ask uh, for unanimous consent to waive standing order 32, 2 and 3 to reduce the interval of the business, uh, sorry, of the division bells to one minute, including the first division in committee of the whole. Honourable members, uh, for clarity's sake, the government house leader is requesting unanimous consent, uh, and I'm sorry, for what duration of time? Uh, for now, let's stick with supper time, or so, to, to seven. Uh, the honorable, uh, for clarity's sake, the honorable government house leader is requesting unanimous consent to go to one minute bells uh, from now uh, until 6 p.m. Uh, I will ask only one question. Is there anyone opposed to granting unanimous consent? If so, please indicate so now. Hearing none, unanimous consent is granted. We are at one minute bells. The Honourable the Government House Leader. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to the Chamber for that. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to move a Government Motion 53. Be it resolved that when further consideration of Bill 35, the tax statutes creating jobs and driving innovation, Amendment Act 2020 is resumed, 
Not more than one hour should be allotted to any further consideration of the bill and committee of the whole, at which time every question necessary uh, for the disposal of the bill at that stage shall be put forthwith. Mr. Speaker, uh, we have several things on the order paper, including this particular bill legislation, uh, Bill 35, uh, which have been in place inside this chamber for weeks. Uh, and that the NDP have continued to uh, filibuster to slow down, despite the fact that they continue to indicate publicly that their main goal is to get to work on Bill 47 and begin to uh, move their amendments. Uh, we have been indicating to the official opposition that we would like to give them the opportunity to do so for weeks now. Unfortunately, they have not. Uh, been moving forward with that. Uh, it is my hope by uh, moving uh, some of this other stuff out of the way, we'll be able to get the official opposition back to work, Mr. Speaker. We will always respect the official opposition's role inside this place, Mr. Speaker, but at the end of the day, it's the government House Leader's job to be able to make sure when legislation is stalled out uh, that the People's House will be able to continue with work and that the majority ultimately will be able to vote on their legislation inside uh, the chamber. Well, members, before the Assembly's Government Motion 53, is there, anyone in, uh, is there anyone else wishing to speak to it? There is the opportunity for one member of the official opposition to respond. The Honourable, the member for Calgary McCall. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. It's uh, unfortunate, but it's not surprising to see this UCP government taking step to close down the legislative session closed down the debate uh, in this House. And I think clearly they are trying to hide uh, from accountability, they are trying to hide from scrutiny of this House. Uh, and I must add that this House is designed to do that. And the impact of this motion is that it will shut down uh, debate in this House. As people representatives, as Albertans representatives, I think we are elected to come here and debate on issues that matter to our constituents. And in this, sessions, in this session, we debated 15 pieces of legislation. We passed 11 pieces of legislation, 37 stages in 24 days. And there was reason that this bill didn't get through, because this bill deals uh, with government plan to hand out $4.7 billion to wealthiest corporation that have not created any jobs as promised by the government, that didn't bring back investment to Alberta as promised by this government. Instead, what we know about this plan what we heard from stakeholders, what we heard from our constituents about this plan is that 50,000 jobs were lost after this uh, piece of policy was introduced. This $4.7 billion was introduced. We saw a doubling of the deficit. We saw that economy shrank by 0.6%. And that was all pre-pandemic. And right now, there are 290,000 Albertans out of work. There is enough evidence, there is enough people and stakeholders out there providing that evidence that this policy is clearly not working. Instead, this policy has resulted in less revenues for the government and more cuts on education and other services like ISH and PDD because government didn't uh, government created that $4.7 billion hole uh, in their budget. So now they are bringing this motion to uh, curtail debate on this important uh, piece of legislation. I don't think that they are doing any service to Albertans, any service to this legislat legis legislature. This legislature is not here to rubber stamp the government policies, government bills. We are here to debate those on behalf of our constituents, on behalf of our Albertans, and that's simply undemocratic and, I guess, shameful for government to bring forward this motion in the middle of a pandemic about a policy that clearly doesn't work. I urge all members of this House that your first and foremost responsibility is not to your government, it's to your constituents. And this policy has resulted in job loss. It didn't create investment, didn't bring back investment, didn't 
bring back prosperity, vote against this motion, vote for democracy, vote for debate in this House, and vote for debate on this important piece of legislation. Because after all, it's Albertans' money, it's $4.7 billion, it's a heck of a lot of money, so we should be able to debate that as much time. We need to debate it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable members, having heard the motion as proposed by the Honourable Government House Leader, does the Assembly agree to the motion? All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Any opposed, please say no. no. In my opinion, the ayes have it. That motion is carried and so ordered, and a division has been called. Call in the members. Mr. Copping, the Honourable Mrs. Allard, the Honourable Mr. Nixon, the Honourable Mr. Taves, the Honourable Mr. McIver, the Honourable Minister LaGrange, the Honourable Mr. Nally, the Honourable Mr. Luan, Mr. Godfrey, Mr. Scow, the Honourable Ms. Schultz, the Honourable Mrs. Savage, the Honourable Mr. Panda, the Honourable Mr. Madhu, the Honourable Mr. Hunter, Mr. Newdorf, the Honourable Mr. Nicolaides, Mr. Churton, Mr. Rutherford, Ms. Isaac, the Honourable Mrs. Zahir, Mr. Walker, the Honourable Mr. Wilson, the Honourable Mr. Schweitzer, the Honourable Mr. Driesen, Mr. Nixon, the Honourable Mr. Klubisch. All those opposed, please rise. Mr. Sabir, Member Hoffman, Mr. Egan, Ms. Pancholi, Mr. Dang, 
Mr. Shepard, Ms. Gamley. Mr. Speaker, total for the motion 27, total against 7. That motion is carried and so ordered. The Honourable the Government House Leader. Oh, sorry. Actually, I think we had to call a motion first, Mr. Speaker, not to tell you how to do it. Under motion, motion number 55, Honourable Mr. Nixon. The Honourable the Government House Leader. Well, uh, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. I do rise to move Government uh, Motion 55 be resolved that when further consideration of Bill 46, the Health Statutes Amendment Act 2020, Number two is resumed. Not more than one hour shall be allotted to any further consideration of the bill in committee of the whole, at which time every question necessary for the disposal of that bill at that stage shall be put forthwith. And Mr. Speaker, I'd refer you to my comments in Hansard on Government Motion 53. Honourable Members, the official opposition has up to five minutes to respond to a government motion. As such, the Honourable the Member for Calgary McCall. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, again, this government is uh, using these heavy-handed tactics to close down debate on this important piece of legislation. And as much these closure motions uh, shouldn't be used, they curtail debate, they are not democratic. They are doing so on a bill that weakens Albertans privacy rights and that's not us saying that's Alberta's information and privacy commissioner saying that this piece of legislation will weaken Albertans health privacy rights it's the independent officer of this legislature who is asking this government to shelve this piece of legislation. They did not answer anything that Office of the Privacy Commissioner asked this government to do. It was a quite lengthy letter and they identified very clearly that this piece of legislation will take things away from AHS and make Minister of Health in charge of all Albertans' health records. This will weaken Albertans' privacy rights. And it's deeply concerning that not only that government refuses to listen to the Office of Privacy Commissioner, not only that government refuses to consult Albertans, they are now moving ahead with a closure motion so they can shut down debate, so they can shut down everyone from talking about this important piece of legislation. That's truly uh, shameful, and that's something I will urge all members of this House, that this piece of legislation impacts every single Albertans. This legislation weakens the privacy rights of every Albertan. They are your constituents. You're elected by them to stand up to protect their interests. And instead, standing up with the government agenda Stand up for your constituent. Vote against this motion because this bill is an important one. It must be debated. Government must listen to information and privacy commissioner. And government should not use these undemocratic tactics yeah. to curtail debate on this piece of legislation. I urge all my colleagues to vote down this government motion and stand up for Albertans, stand up for your constituents. Yeah. They elected you. You are accountable to them, not this government. Thank you. Honourable members, having heard the motion as proposed by the Honourable Government House Leader on Government Motion 55, does the Assembly agree to the motion? If so, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? 
opposed, please say no. No. Uh, in my opinion, the ayes have it. That motion is carried and so ordered, and a division has been called. Call in the member. Honourable members, a division has been called on Government Motion 55. All those in favour of the motion, please rise and be counted. The Honourable Mr. Copping, the Honourable Mrs. Allard, the Honourable Mr. Nixon, the Honourable Mr. Taves, the Honourable Mr. McIver, the Honourable Minister LaGrange, the, the Honourable Mr. Luan, Mr. Godfried, Mr. Scow, the Honourable Ms. Schultz, the Honourable Mrs. Savage, the Honourable Mr. Panda, the Honourable Mr. Madu, the Honourable Mr. Hunter, Mr. Newdorf, the Honourable Mr. Nicolaides, Mr. Turton, Mr. Rutherford, Ms. Isaac, the Honourable Mrs. Zahir, Mr. Walker, the Honorable Mr. Wilson, the Honorable Mr. Schweitzer, the Honorable Mr. Dresion, Mr. Nixon, the Honorable Mr. Glubish. All those members opposed to Government Motion 55, please rise and be counted. Mr. Sabir, Member Hoffman, Mr. Egan, Ms. Pancholi, Mr. Dang, Mr. Shepherd, Ms. Gamley. Mr. Speaker, total for the motion 26, total opposed 7. Honorable members, that motion is carried and so ordered. Under government motions, motion number 59, Honorable Mr. Nixon. <clears throat> I see the Honorable Government House Leader. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to move Government Motion 59, be it resolved that when further, further consideration 
of Bill 48, Red Tape Reduction Implementation Act 2020, number two, is resumed. Not more than one hour should be allotted to any further consideration of the bill and committee of the whole, at which time every question necessary for the disposal of the bill at that stage shall be put forthwith. Mr. Speaker, I will refer you to my comments in regards to Government Motion 53 with enhancer. Thank you, Honourable Member. Under Standing Order 21 sub 3, there is an opportunity for response. I see the Honourable Member for Calgary McCall has risen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think it's a pattern uh, from this government that they will uh, limit the debate on anything and everything that they think they have not consulted on, that they think Albertans are opposed to, and they are doing that in the middle of a pandemic with a bill that amends more than 10 pieces of legislation. It's an omnibus piece of legislation. One, the limited debate on this piece of legislation by putting together 10, 12 pieces of legislation of significant changes in one bill, and now they are moving to limit the debate. And they will go at any length to curtail the debate. They cancel three weeks of morning sittings this session. Only reason that you can think of is either they don't like to work in the morning, <laughs> or they don't want any debate on these important pieces of legislation. And they are laughing. It's not a laughing matter. There are many people who would like to come work in the morning, like many Albertans who do that, and deal with other responsibilities, family responsibilities, children responsibilities in the evening. And they would, like, they would prefer to debate these things in morning hours government cancelled debate for three weeks and now they're moving this uh, motion so they can curtail debate and ram through the changes that they didn't consult on that impact many Albertans that take powers away from uh, municipalities who they didn't consult. So that's undemocratic and again to all members of this house. We all have a vested interest in our institution of democracy. And these kind of tactics undermine democracy. When you limit and curtail debate, you undermine democracy. And as representatives of Albertans, I think that's first and foremost your responsibility to stand up for your constituents, to stand up for those who elected you, to stand up to protect these institutions. I urge all members to vote against this motion. It curtails debate, it curtails democracy, it's undemocratic, and it's shameful. Yeah. Thank you, Honourable Member. Having heard the motion, Motion 59, as proposed by the Honourable Government House Leader, all those in favour of the motion, please say aye. aye. Any opposed, please say no. no. That motion is carried. A division has been called. Ring the bells.
Honourable Members, a division has been called on Government Motion 59 as proposed by the Honourable Government House Leader. All those in favour of the motion, please rise. The Honourable Mr. Copping, the Honourable Mrs. Allard, the Honourable Mr. Nixon, the Honourable Mr. Taves, the Honourable Mr. McIver, the Honourable Mr. Glubish, the Honourable Minister Lagrange, the Honourable Mr. Luan, Mr. Godfrey, Mr. Scow, the Honourable Ms. Schultz, the Honourable Mrs. Savage, the Honourable Mr. Panda, the Honourable Mr. Madhu, the Honourable Mr. Hunter, Mr. Newdorf, the Honourable Mr. Nicolaides, Mr. Churton, Mr. Rutherford, Ms. Isaac, the Honourable Mrs. Ahir, Mr. Walker, the Honourable Mr. Wilson, the Honourable Mr. Schweitzer, the Honourable Mr. Driesian, Mr. Nixon. Thank you, Honourable Members. All those opposed to Government Motion 59, please rise. Mr. Sabir, Member Hoffman, Mr. Egan, Ms. Pancholi, Mr. Dang, Mr. Shepherd, Ms. Ganley. Mr. Speaker, total for the motion 26, total opposed 7. That motion is carried and so ordered. Committee of the Whole. Thank you, Honourable Members. I would like to call the Committee to order. The Committee of the Whole has under consideration Bill 46, Health Statutes Amendment Act 2020, Number 2. Are there any comments or questions to be offered with respect to this bill? We are currently on Amendment A3. I see the Honourable Member for Edmonton Northwest. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and certainly um, considering the uh, very undemocratic constraints that we have imposed upon us here, uh, I will keep my comments brief, but succinct and very pointed as well. This bill is a compromise to the integrity of individuals' health records, and I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, that is a fundamental breach of trust that <clears throat> each Albertan employs when we use and engage in, the in, our, in our public health system. And I can't help to think, Mr. Chair, that this is a direct way by which to open the door to American two-tier style health care, where you make your money off of insurance and off of <clears throat> making a bet on how a person's health is and the state of their health. And if you have pre-existing conditions and the insurance companies get that information, you are going to pay an awful lot of money or you will be excluded from getting your health services, quite frankly. This is why in the United States, for example, it costs between 10 and 15 times more to deliver any given procedure compared to Canada. And so this whole notion that we can somehow put the health records and allow that information to move across borders, to move to different jurisdictions, to be handled by third-party contractors, again, it speaks volumes about the attitude of this UCP government towards health care. They are here to systematically dismantle it and to make money off of it. And you can make a lot of money off of human misery, Mr. Chair. You can make a lot of money when, because people will pay, of course, for what their loved one needs medical services. They will pay because, of course, you'll sell your house. You'll do whatever you can if your child or someone or your loved one is, is sick. And private health care profits off of that. 
That's why we built a public system in the first place. That's why we maintain the integrity of our health records. And that's why I think that this bill is absolutely despicable, and I would encourage all members to vote against it. Thank you, Honourable Member. Are there any other members looking to join debate on Amendment A3? See none on the amendment as proposed by the Honourable Member for Edmonton City Centre. Are you agreed? All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. No. That is defeated. Moving on to Bill 46, I see the Honourable Member for Edmonton City Centre. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I did see to hear a bit of hesitation in the government in voting down that last amendment, so perhaps we should try another and roll the dice. So I do have another amendment that I would like to put forward, and I will wait for that to reach you. This will be Amendment A4. Just um, thank you very much. And honourable member, if you could please read it in to the record for the benefit of all those here. As always, there will be copies provided at each table. Uh, at the entrances, and then, of course, if you'd like a copy, uh, you can raise your hand and it will be uh, delivered to you. Again, this will be A4 if the Honourable Member for Edmonton City Centre could continue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, to read into the record. Uh, moving th that Bill 46, the Health Statutes Amendment Act 2020, number 2, be amended by striking out Section 63. So, this is referring, Mr. Chair, to the section of this bill which removes the requirement for Alberta Health, the Ministry, Alberta Health Services, and the Health Quality Council of Alberta to perform a privacy impact assessment for changes that are made to privacy legislation, or for, uh, pardon me, for elements that are brought in. So basically anything new that is handling private health information in the province of Alberta, be that software, be that new system, be that a new program, being that allowing any new use or access to provide that protection for Albertans. Now, we have heard loud and clear from the Privacy and Information Commissioner, independent officer of the legislature, that this legislation, in fact, needs serious work. And so we're bringing forward this amendment an amendment that would remove the exemption for Alberta Health, Alberta Health Services, Health Quality Council of Alberta to do privacy impact assessments when it comes to the sharing of health information. As members of this chamber would know well, or at least I certainly hope they would know well, I would hope that they have read the substantive letter that was written by the Commissioner to the Minister of Health outlining her significant concerns with this legislation. She was very clear in that letter about how problematic this legislation is. Indeed, in respect to this specific issue, she wrote publicly, I cannot stress more emphatically my concerns. She went on to say the duty to complete a privacy impact assessment offsets risk to broad sharing of Alberta's health information without their consent. So obviously there is a serious issue here. And I do believe we should continue to listen to these cautionary words from the independent officer of this legislature to whom we have entrusted the work of safeguarding Albertans' privacy. Indeed, just last Friday, at a member of the Standing Committee on Legislative Offices, and I look around this room and I see members who were there at that very meeting and heard these words directly from the Information and Privacy Commissioner, where she went even further than she did in her letter to the Minister. She spoke through that committee to all of us here in this legislature and stated that her serious concerns around the transparency of the government's initiatives enabled by this legislation. I encourage all members 
to take the opportunity to read those words, words which I had hoped to share this House, but given this government's decision that they want to run and hide and not debate the substantive and dangerous legislation that they brought in front of this House. I will forego that. So this legislature does have a decision to make. Do we respect the privacy rights of Albertans? Are we going to listen to the experts? Are what our constituents are in fact telling us, which is that we should be hitting pause on these unconsulted, sweeping changes. Because we can, we must do better, and no Albertan, in my view, voted for the release of their private health information. No Albertan voted for watering down the safeguards that are there to protect them. Yet, that is exactly what we have in this bill, which this government is endeavoring to rush through in the midst of a pandemic. They've been unclear about their intent, Mr. Chair, but I do know that this legislation, as it's currently written, infringes on the privacy rights of Albertans, puts at risk their private health information. And this legislature should not let that happen. So I urge all members of the chamber to accept this amendment and ensure that privacy impact assessments continue to be made whenever we are looking at the sharing of Albertans' private health information. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Honourable Member. We are on Amendment A4. I see the Honourable Member for Edmonton, Glenora, has risen. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and uh, to members for the opportunity to debate this important amendment. Um, this is one of the... There are many bills that are problematic this session, but this is one of the bills where the independent officer of this legislature who works for all of us has written to request that we do not proceed with this bill. The independent officer of the legislature, who we have appointed, and, and wasn't just appointed uh, under this legislature or under the last legislature, but has been in place for at least three legislatures, was appointed under uh, PC government and has served uh, all three uh, parties. Um, and uh, all members of the assembly, as an independent officer of the legislature, has raised the alarms on this piece of legislation. So taking the time to undo some of the worst pieces that are in it, pieces that specifically undermine the uh, protection of personal and private information, would be in our best interest as members of this assembly, uh, not just as uh, people who are voting on a specific piece of legislation. Uh, we are here to make laws that will stand, hopefully, in perpetuity. And the similar types of alarms that have been raised on this bill at this time are similar to the ones that were raised with regard to Bill 10 in the spring. And the government in the spring chose to move forward full speed ahead on a piece of legislation that people outside of this legislature, as well as inside of this legislature, were saying, slow down, put the e-brake on, wait, make sure you don't overreach, and the government chose to overreach, and instead it created a whole new um, mess for the government that involved uh, people filing uh, actions against the government, the government forming a special committee, the government undoing parts of their legislation. This is an opportunity today in this amendment to say we've learned from the spring, we're pulling the brake, we're going to look at the evidence. We're going to actually uh, work with the independent officer of the legislature to make sure that we get this right and that we're not um, uh, overreaching on uh, what is uh, appropriate for information sharing with uh, the people of Alberta, but also that we're not going to waste more government time, resources, uh, and, and dollars in court or otherwise um, having to undo mistakes that this House has made because this government was uh, so... Um, strong-headed in moving forward with their original draft. This is an opportunity to act on the information that was given to all of us to make this bill less problematic. It would be wise for us to uh, accept this amendment and move forward uh, acknowledging the expert advice of the independent officer of this legislature and her recommendations for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Honourable Member. We are on Amendment A4. I see the Honourable Member for Edmonton White Mud has risen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I had the pleasure to speak to this bill uh, a few times in the Committee of the Whole, um, and I, I've said this a couple of times, and I will continue to highlight it, that the amendments that are being brought forward today um, under the name of the, uh, the member from Edmonton City Centre are all thoughtful amendments not driven by any partisan or political perspective. There's no difference of policy or, or, or politics on these issues, unless 
the government is prepared to explain what their intent is, because given the information that we have received from the Office of the Information and Privacy Commissioner about the uh, errors in some cases, and we're, we're being generous perhaps by saying they're errors, um, of, of the changes that they're making to allow for um, greater disclosure without consent of Albertans' personal private health information, it can only be assumed, Mr. Chair, that that was not intentional because we have not yet to hear um, uh, from the Minister of Health, and I guess we're not going to um, because we've invoked closure on this, uh, uh, the government's invoked closure on this, and so we've only got a limited amount of time. But the, it is not yet clear why the Minister of Health or this government believes that it should not subject um, uh, the, the process of managing net care, which is incredibly personal health information, to a privacy impact assessment, Mr. Chair. We have not heard the reason why. These amendments are very thoughtful and brought forward as a result of the recommendations that came forward, forward from the Office of the Information Privacy Commissioner. A privacy impact assessment, Mr. Chair, for those who may not be aware, is a process of analysis that is undertaken by the Office of the Information and Privacy Commissioner to help identify and address potential privacy risks that may result as a, as a result of a new legislative scheme, in this case, Alberta Health, for example, um, taking over responsibility for net care and uh, potentially doing uh, other things that it's not normally doing or not doing right now with net care, um, including, obviously, we know that there's an intent behind this bill to allow for author, uh, author, authorized users outside of the jurisdiction of Alberta to have access to Albertans' uh, health information. Um, so the process of a privacy impact assessment is simply to look at, at what government or any body is doing with respect to uh, a new legislative scheme and saying, look, let's identify those risks. Let's identify the risks to privacy and security. We all have an interest in making sure that we can get ahead of those issues, and that's the expertise that the Office of the Information and Privacy Commissioner brings. She understands where those risks lie. She has a great deal of, of, of expertise and experience. She's overseen and, and, and provided judgment on a number of uh, security breaches, and this is what she, the benefit that that process brings. It is a benefit to the government. It is a benefit to, the, to Albertans to know that any potential security and privacy risks have been identified and potentially addressed. That's the, that is the purpose of a privacy impact assessment. And yet, in Bill 46, we see that the government has said that, no, they don't have to complete that. And I simply am confounded as to why. Why does the government not want to undertake a privacy impact assessment? It is, uh, it is to the benefit of all of us, Mr. Chair. And so, again, this is a thoughtful amendment. It is not intended to be partisan in nature. I think we can all agree across partisan lines that we believe in security and protection of privacy around health information. Unless, by failing to answer, by failing to speak up and to explain why they are removing themselves from the requirements uh, uh, from privacy assessments, which I have to say, Mr. Chair, looking at Bill 46, was deliberate. Is it, it is a deliberate uh, drafting change to exclude um, the government of Alberta from and Minister of Health and the Ministry of Health from a privacy impact assessment. What is the motivation behind that? We have yet to hear that. So I, I think it is a reasonable thing to suggest that let's put that process back in place. Privacy impact assessments, by the way, Mr. Chair, are often advisory. They're recommendations. They're certainly not um, meant to tie the minister's hands or the ministry's hands. If they have good reasons as to why they're taking certain actions, they can discuss that, work that through with the Office of the Information and Privacy Commissioner. There is nothing uh, about a privacy impact assessment that should be detrimental to anything that the government seeks to achieve by bringing forward Bill 46, unless, Mr. Chair, and we have no, we can reach no other conclusion than, to, than that the, the, this government does want to uh, subject Albertans' health information to greater risk and breach of privacy. That is the only explanation we have so far. Um, and if that is not the case, if the government does not intend to create additional risks to the privacy of Albertans' private, uh, private personal health information, then they should support this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Honourable Member. Are there any other members wishing to join debate on A4? I see the Honourable Member for Edmonton South. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it's a pleasure to rise and speak to this amendment, uh, raised by my colleague from Edmonton City Centre. And Mr. Chair, let me be very clear. This is not a partisan issue. This is not an issue that is divided on partisan lines. This is, this is an issue that is being raised by the independent office of the Information and Privacy Commissioner here in Alberta. So, Mr. Chair, when, when we hear from the Information and Privacy Commissioner about how problematic this current legislation is, when we hear from the independent officer of this legislature um, that she, uh, and I quote, cannot stress more emphatically uh, her concerns, end quote, Mr. Chair, I, 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 I'm particularly concerned with the direction this government is taking. I'm particularly concerned with the direction this government is taking. Uh, and, and, I, and I applaud this amendment because I think it does address those concerns. It does ensure that we bring back safeguards, such as the privacy impact assessment. Uh, we know this government is not interested in, in, in bringing in safeguards um, around uh, foreign or organizations controlling um, Albertans' data and foreign organizations having uh, access to Albertans' data, but we have the opportunity here when we deal with um, organizations that are within Alberta, such as the Alberta Health Quality Council, um, so, such as the um, Alberta Health Services and Alberta Health, and when we, when we do the sharing of information, we have the opportunity here to ensure that we have the proper, uh, the proper safeguards and measures in place. Um, the, the Information and Privacy Commissioner specifically spoke to some of the technical requirements and technical uh, aspects of her role. And I, uh, I think those are particularly important because when we look at how uh, information is shared, how data sharing works, when, when Alberta Health transmits information to the Alberta Health Quality Council, when, when Alberta Health uh, receives information from Alberta Health Services, when, when those data transfers happen, um, it's important that we recognize there are technical considerations. And, and one of those very significant uh, technical uh, considerations is, is anonymization of data. Right? When we talk about data, um, for example, when we're, when we're dealing with the current global pandemic, when we're dealing with the current pandemic, one of those things is ensuring that as information is transmitted, uh, when we're counting up right now the, the current daily new cases, the current daily new deaths, the current daily new uh, total cases, uh, when, we, when we look at information like that, anonymization of data is so essential because it allows us to share information with researchers. It allows us to share information with academics, with institutions that are going to be able to help um, with, with public health, with Alberta Health that's doing public health modeling, that's with information that's going to be able to help us react more appropriately to the pandemic. So when Alberta Health and, and public health makes recommendations, they are using Alberta Health Services data. They are using information that um, at its source is identifiable. Um, at, at the source, when it's collected, is identifiable and, and, and will have real impact if that data is misused. It will have real impact, um, for example, during this pandemic, during this COVID-19 pandemic, if the data is, is, is misused, it could have repercussions in terms of uh, people being uh, mistreated at work. They could be mistreated in, in, if they try to enter businesses. They could, be, they could be targeted on social media. There are real consequences for Albertans if this information is, uh, is attributed improperly. So when we look at the Information and Privacy Commissioner specifically saying they have people of technical background um, who can look at these systems and look at the processes in which information is shared from organization to organization. Look at how Alberta Health Services transmits that data to Alberta, uh, to, to Alberta Health and Public Health, transmits that data to, to institutions that can do research. Um, it's important that we recognize these concerns are not hypothetical. These concerns are happening right now. The very changes that are, that are being discussed have impacts on, on the data we are processing right now. The information that in about eight minutes here will be presented by, by, by Dr. Dina Hinshaw to all of Alberta, the, the, the new daily case numbers that are going to be uh, transmitted to all of Alberta in about eight minutes. That information needs to be anonymized to protect Albertans, to protect their privacy rights, to protect their individual rights, to protect their safety. Um, and, and Mr. Chair, what the government is su suggesting is that those privacy impact assessments should no longer be done. It's not suggesting it, they're legislating it, Mr. Chair. They're, 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 they're asserting that we no longer need these privacy impact assessments. But we know that's not true. Albertans know that's not true. We know that personal private medical health records um, are confidential and are the property and, 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 and do belong to Albertans. This government does not have the right to disclose that information. This government does not have the right to, to, to give consent on behalf of Albertans to have that information go out. And the Information and Privacy Commissioner thinks that this is a particularly concerning uh, measure. And, and Mr. Chair, we're not saying that the government will intentionally misuse this data. We're not saying the government or, or Alberta Health Services or, or Alberta Health or, or um, the Alberta Health Quality Council will, will intentionally misuse this information. But if we don't have people with technical backgrounds like the Information and Privacy Commissioner doing these reviews and ensuring that these processes are put in place, uh, if we don't have these safeguards and checks in place, 
then misuse of the information uh, may occur inadvertently because it is all too easy for, for, for organizations to, to, to improperly transmit information, to improperly an anonymize information, to improperly uh, uh, transmit information in a way that may be de-anonymized. Uh, and, and we see that happen all the time, Mr. Chair. We see, we, see, we see these mistakes happen all the time, and that's why it's essential that we have experts reviewing this. Well, that's why we have, it, it's important we have experts reviewing these processes and reviewing these systems. Because systemic errors, Mr. Chair, are very hard to identify. It's very hard to, 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 to realize this. And, and that's why you need technical expertise brought into the loop on this. Uh, for somebody who's outside the organization reviewing these processes, having, having safeguards and checks and balances uh, time and time again. And, and, and that's something that, again, is not just the opinion of this opposition. It's not just the opinion of my colleague who's introduced the amendment, uh, my colleague from the city center here. But indeed, it's actually the opinion of the Information Privacy Commissioner, an independent officer of this legislature, um, who, 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 Mr. Chair, uh, has said again and again that as this legislation is currently drafted, it infringes on the privacy rights of Albertans, it reduces the, the rights of Albertans, it diminishes the rights of Albertans, and this legislature should not and cannot let that happen. So, so we must accept this amendment. I, I look forward to hearing from more of my colleagues. But really, there are real impacts. We see that every single day in this place. We see that every single day in the daily updates right now in COVID, that if the information was improperly transmitted, we would have significant ramifications for every single Albertan. Thank you. Thank you, Honourable Member. We are on A4. Are there any members wishing to... I see the Honourable Member for Lethbridge East has risen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, appreciate that to respond to this amendment. Uh, I, I believe that there are some significant positive impacts to sharing this personal information. Uh, and I understand the concerns brought forward by the, the members opposite. But I'd like to ask four simple W questions I learned in elementary school. Who? So this data being shared, who is it being shared with? And I believe the Act still includes the definition of a custodian and uh, who that would, that would be and who that would be defined by and who that would be uh, generated for. Uh, and then I will come back to that, but the second question is where? I, myself, like many other Albertans, often like to enjoy traveling outside the, the boundaries of our wonderful province. Uh, into other jurisdictions, whether that's other provinces, states, or other, uh, other nations around the world. So they may have uh, some significant need to access that information if you're traveling. For instance, if you're traveling to the United States and you happen to get into an accident of some sort. <coughs> Many questions uh, that I've learned over the, the time uh, being married to my wife, who is a nurse, things that, that could impact the need for this kind of information. This is the why question, uh, Mr. Chair. They may, uh, medical professionals may need to know your blood type. That could be quite critical in a, in a medical emergency. Uh, they would need to know any allergies. My wife happens to be allergic to penicillin. She's given penicillin, which is a very common uh, interaction with all kinds of medical emergencies. It could be uh, significantly hazardous to her life. Uh, other health conditions. Uh, that medical uh, uh, officers would need to know in their treatment of whatever could happen to you. And as we, we've often discussed in the House, time is, is often a factor in responding to whatever that medical emergency could be. Having to go through significant hoops and jumps and take mm -hmm. time to do that could significantly compromise the treatment that one could receive. And when is the last question I just wanted to speak to in terms of that information. Uh, often, if you're in a medical emergency, you are you could be alone, you could be unconscious, you could be unable to respond for yourself due to that medical emergency. Something as simple and perhaps as deadly as a, a bee sting if you're allergic to that. So that is, those are some of the cases why and wherefore this data would need to be shared in an appropriate, safe and protected manner. So yes, to the members of protecting the privacy of Alberta's health information is and always will be a priority to the government of Alberta. These amendments would not change Alberta's obligations under the Act to safeguard patient health information. In fact, the proposed amendments include tougher penalties for in inappropriate access to a person's health information as well as the breach reporting requirements that already exist. So uh, while, with all due respect, I understand the letter from the Information and Privacy Commissioner that this information should be protected and taken care of. I, I do agree with that. But I do also agree that timely and quick access with jurisdictions outside of the realm of Alberta should be considered. 
In my opinion, I will not be supporting this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Honourable Member. I see the Honourable Member for Edmonton City Centre has risen on A4. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Chair. Just to respond quickly to the comments from the member from Lethbridge East, which unfortunately did not address anything in the amendment that's in front of us, which is about restoring privacy impact assessments that the government is removing. So uh, I appreciate his remarks, though, and would like to just comment on them briefly. Um, in terms of who, as I addressed in previous amendments, there are serious gaps in terms of the definitions here. So the definition of a custodian, yes, still remains. But an authorized user is left fairly blank. And indeed, who now is consolidating all of this power in the hands of the minister? Whereas before, it was more in the realm of the independent through Alberta Health Services. So there is a significant change in the who. In terms of the where, indeed, we all enjoy traveling outside of Alberta. But this is not limited simply to that circumstance in which Albertans still currently receive medical care when they are out of country. That currently exists and currently takes place, and certainly improving that is a good thing, Mr. Chair. But this also opens up access by any organization outside Alberta if the minister deems it fit, not under specific medical circumstances like the, me like the member was just speaking of. And speaking of the word, if there is something that is, there is no protection for that Albert. None. Now, I can appreciate that maybe the member feels he would be willing to take that gamble in an emergency situation, but this is not limited to that. And that is the first time anybody in this House has mentioned that circumstance, and certainly the minister has never mentioned that as a reason or intent for bringing forward this. Why? Well, I think we just touched on that again. There's a lot of why here, Mr. Chair, outside of that one very specific targeted instance the member just mentioned. And when, indeed, I recognize time is of the essence in that one very specific instance. But the biggest question, Mr. Chair, is why was none of this discussed with the Information and Privacy Commissioner? Why is the government cutting her out of the loop entirely? If this is so essential and so important and so innocuous, certainly that conversation could have been brief, focused, and they could have brought forward legislation which would not endanger the health information of Albertans and certainly would have clearly understood the value of a privacy impact assessment and why the government should not be exempting itself from doing that due diligence on the part of Albertans. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's also with regards to amendments, too. Thank you, Honourable Member. We are on A4. Are there any members wishing to join debate? Seeing none. On the amendment, as proposed by the Honourable Member for Edmonton City Centre, all those in favour of the amendment, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. No. That is defeated. A division has been called. Call in the members.
Honourable members, a division has been called on Amendment A4 regarding Bill 46. All those in favour of the motion as proposed by the Honourable Member for Edmonton City Centre, please rise and be counted. Mr. Sabir, Member Hoffman, Mr. Egan, Ms. Pancholi, Member Dang, Mr. Shepherd, Ms. Ganley. All those opposed to Amendment A4, please rise and be counted. Honorable Mr. Copping, Honorable Mrs. Allard, Honorable Mr. Nixon, Honorable Mr. Taves, Honorable Mr. McIver, Honorable Mr. Glubish, Honorable Minister LaGrange, Honorable Mr. Lewan, Mr. Gottfried, Mr. Scow, Honorable Ms. Schultz, Honorable Ms. Savage, Honorable Mr. Panda, Honorable Mr. Wilson, Mr. Newdor, Honorable Mr. Nicolaides, Mr. Turton, Mr. Rutherford, Ms. Isaac, Honorable Mrs. Zahir, Mr. Walker, Mr. Nixon, Honorable Mr. Hunter, Honorable Mr. Dreeshen. Mr. Chair, total for the Amendment 7, total opposed, 24. That amendment is defeated. We are now back onto the bill. I see the Honourable Member for Edmonton City Centre has risen. We'll make one last attempt, Mr. Chair, to make this bill, this bad bill, a little bit. Thank you, Honourable Member. This will be referred to as Amendment A5. As always, same procedure. There are copies at the tables, and if you put up your hands, you can receive one. If the Honourable Member could please read it in for uh, the record for the benefit of everybody listening and here, and then again, it will be Amendment A5. The Honourable Member. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I am moving that Bill 46, the Health Statutes Amendment Act 2020, number two, be amended in Section 68. A, by, renumber, by renumbering Clause A as Clause A1, and B, by adding the following immediately before Clause A1, A, by adding the following immediately after subsection 2B, B1, to make accessible or attempt to make accessible health information in contravention of this Act, and B2, to limit accessibility or attempt to limit accessibility to health information in contravention of this Act. Now, Mr. Chair, page 5 of the Information and Privacy Commissioner's letter to the Minister of Health outlines her significant concerns with the changes to expressed wishes of Albertans when it comes to their private information. She notes that expressed wishes provision is extremely important to the operation of net care without being able to consent this is the last measure of control an Albertan has over what health information is made available via NetCare. The last measure of control that an Albertan has over their private health care information, Mr. Chair. As it currently stands, the Health Information Act includes a provision that requires a custodian to consider an Albertan's expressed wishes about how much of their health information should be made available. Questions have been raised by the Information and Privacy Commissioner, and I appreciate, Mr. Chair, that we are in the midst of a global pandemic, and I appreciate the Minister has many important responsibilities. But if he is too busy to stand and justify a bill this significant, he is too busy to be moving this bill right now. And this government should be listening to the Information and Privacy Commissioner in pulling this bill from this House and engaging in the robust consultation that should have taken place and has not. And indeed, she says here quite clearly, I request the detailed con that detailed consultation be held with health service providers and my office on this amendment and the development of related regulations. So, this amendment is important, and the amendment that I'm bringing forward, let me be clear, it ensures that a person making health information accessible will have to consider 
the wishes of the relevant person patient in terms of making their health information accessible. And at a time when this government has been speaking very loudly about wanting to respect the rights of Albertans, the essential need for them to do so, to the point that they are balancing lives and livelihoods based on that consideration. I do not understand why in this particular case they are removing this right for Albertans. At its core, this amendment is about protecting Albertans' privacy rights. If the person that is making this health information accessible doesn't consider the wishes of a relevant person patient, then under this amendment, they will be guilty of an offense. I think that is appropriate, Mr. Chair. The member for Lethbridge East spoke about the increased penalties that the government is bringing in. In this case, they are removing it with no explanation and no justification against the recommendation of the Information and Privacy Commissioner. So this is complex legislation. I get it. But I think this is an incredibly important fix. Without this amendment, the expressed wishes of Albertans could be ignored. And critically, the Information and Privacy Commissioner will not have the power, the jurisdiction, to step in and protect the privacy rights of that individual, of individual Albertans. I can't imagine a scenario where this government would want to ignore the expressed wishes of Albertans when it comes to their health information. But here we are in the midst of a pandemic with a bill that does precisely that. So I bring this amendment forward to rectify that problem. I know that we don't always agree on a lot in this chamber. But I would hope this is one thing we could agree on, that the expressed wishes of Albertans when it comes to their private health information is important, is essential, and should be upheld. So I urge all members to support this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Honourable Member. On Amendment A5, I see the Honourable Member for Calgary Mountain View has risen. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'm pleased to rise and speak to this amendment. We have, of course, moved a number of amendments to this bill, and most of them center around uh, the same thing. The Information and Privacy Commissioner has significant concerns about this bill. Um, it was not uh, consulted with her as the minister, um, well, the minister stated he did consult with her, which uh, she pointed out was incorrect, shall we say. Um, and so this is another attempt um, to, to put walls around the private health information of Albertans, to ensure that that information is protected. And in this case, to ensure that a custodian um, is in a position to do a review uh, in accordance with the expressed wishes of uh, an individual. So I think we've heard loud and clear from the Information Privacy Commissioner, who is an independent officer who works not only for all of us in this chamber, but for every Albertan to safeguard the privacy rights of Albertans, that this bill needs some changes. Um, and I'm not surprised to hear the members opposite suggest uh, that it doesn't need changes. Um, it certainly wouldn't be uh, the first time they have felt the need to uh, question the expertise or independence of independent officers of this legislature. Um, certainly we have seen them fire an independent officer of this legislature uh, for investigating them as outlined in the mandate. Um, we have certainly seen them um, attack the expertise of the um, ethics commissioner in, in suggesting that if she was allowed to consider privileged information that that would be um, extremely problematic, which is, uh, you know, funny coming from some of those members that don't have legal training to stand up and say that a woman with legal training would be unable to consider that information. Um, so I'm not surprised to see them once again stand up and suggest that a woman with significant experience in this area uh, shouldn't be the one making the decision, that her advice and her expertise is insufficient uh, grounds on which to question this legislation, that instead um, members of this chamber, members of the UCP caucus, despite their lack of expertise in the area, 
are better positioned to make those decisions. Um, I think that this is, I mean, it's incredibly problematic. I shouldn't be surprised uh, because it often seems uh, that the members across the way are allergic to the concept of expertise, to the concept of evidence. Um, they make statements all the time in this place um, about quote unquote so-called experts. <laughs> so-called uh, in the sense that they are, are recognized um, by the public at large as experts in their area. Uh, but the members opposite feel that they should question it because those, the data and the expertise and the analysis and the logic of the situation counteracts their rhetoric and their ideology. Um, and I think that that is in, extremely problematic. And in this case, that ideology, that intention to move forward, to uh, discredit the expertise um, of people who work in this very area will harm the privacy rights of Albertans. It will harm their right to have control over the private health information about themselves which I think is incredibly problematic and continues to be incredibly problematic. We've made multiple attempts to attempt to clean up this legislation. This is only one of them. But what this would do is enable um, a custodian to consider the issue, to essentially consider what an Albertan, who may not be able to speak for themselves in that moment, would have wanted to happen with their own private information. Um, I think that's a relevant consideration. I'm surprised to discover that anyone would think that wasn't a relevant consideration. What more relevant consideration could there be when dealing with the private and personal health information of an individual Albertan than what we think that person would want. So I am incredibly uh, in favor of this uh, amendment. Um, I would urge all members to vote in favor of this. I'm, I'm concerned. I'm concerned uh, that this legislation is moving through with the speed that it is moving through. I am concerned that it is occurring in the middle of a pandemic. I am concerned that the minister is not here to answer. Member. So. I think I have already interjected. I have already interjected on this prior to the point of order being called. I would just ask that the honourable member withdraw the comments and continue with her. Um, allow me to rephrase. We, ha we have not heard a justification for this. Not really sure what the heckling is about, but okay. Um, so, yes. Okay. Um, so, to carry on, I think the concern here is that we haven't heard a justification for why we need to remove the protections around Albertans and around their privacy. The concern here is that we've made multiple attempts to improve this, multiple attempts in accordance with what the Information and Privacy Commissioner, an independent officer of this legislature charged with having the expertise in this very area has suggested we do, and the government has voted them all down with little to no explanation for why. So I am concerned, I think Albertans are concerned, and I think they are rightfully concerned by this legislation. And with that, Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Chair, I will simply say that I urge all members to vote, against, to vote in favour of this amendment. Thank you, Honourable Member. Are there any other members looking to join on A5? I see the Honourable Member for Calgary Buffalo has Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity to speak briefly to what's before us and my amendments put forward, the amendments put forward by my colleague Edmonton City Centre and supported by this side. Um, you know, I, I'm very uh, disheartened and disappointed that uh, the amendments are uh, coming up against uh, stonewalling from the other side. And in this case, uh, the, the, the health statutes amendment put forward by the Minister of Health 
expands the number of permitted uses incredibly that uh, this uh, health information of Albertans can be used for. Investigations, it's set, and this I'm taking from the, uh, uh, the officer, the information privacy uh, officer's um, commissioner's letter uh, that is substantive and eight pages and has an attachment to it and where she lays out all the concerns and the additional uses, permitted uses that are in this health statute include investigations, practice reviews, discipline proceedings and inspections of a health profession or discipline. And it includes research, it includes education, it includes internal management, including planning, resource allocation, policy development, quality improvement, monitoring, audit, evaluation, reporting, and human resource management. And none of that comes with a concomitant uh, protections that are currently in legislation that get changed with this legislation. And the uh, Privacy Commissioner is saying, you know, maybe you can do that. But you have to have similar kinds of protections for the use of that information. And we're not seeing that here. I do know that uh, it was raised that uh, there will be a, an incredible fine that could be levied on people who contra contravene the, st uh, the aspects of this statute, health statutes. But, you know, the horse is already out of the barn at that point in time. I want to uh, uh, just remind members on the other side that even in grad school and universities, those graduates, uh, if they want to use information, if they want to conduct studies, research, education, they have to go through an ethics review. And that's, that's standard practice. None of that is going to happen with this new Bill 46. And that's at the, uh, the, the that's at, puts Albertans at significant risk in terms of the sharing of their information, health information, health records, which uh, Albertans and people generally uh, throughout the world hold very close and dear. Um, who wants others knowing your health information, your private information, if there's not uh, safeguards in place regarding the use and dissemination of that information. So I think the, uh, the, the amendment brought forward is clear, it's unambiguous, um, it, it ensures that a person making health information accessible will have to consider the wishes of the relevant person patient in terms of making their health information accessible. And what, what is wrong with that? Where does that come up against uh, objections from the other side. Obviously it does, uh, and I don't think Albertans are, are understand what the objection would be from the other side. So if a person goes on to say from our amendment, if a person making health information accessible does not consider the wishes of a relevant person patient, they will be guilty of an offence. Again, um, the, the need to put in some safeguards and belts and braces in this uh, uh, legislation is, can't be under, 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 underestimated or underscored enough. We need to do that for the protection of Albertans. The uh, amendment rectifies the problems that uh, we identify here and uh, we certainly uh, believe that it's in the best interest of Albertans. It needs to take place. And uh, my colleague from Edmonton City Centre has done yeoman's duty uh, with getting into this bill, trying to make a bad bill better. Uh, and believe, believe me, we have put uh, a series of amendments forward that uh, have endeavoured to make this bad bill better for Albertans. Um, I, uh, I, I'm just, uh, again, last night I read the uh, letter from the uh, Information Privacy Commissioner, uh, I, um, read it again today, and uh, I, never have I uh, read a letter that is so clear in terms of seeing the issues, uh, laying out a course of action to fix the issues that are identified, and uh, just, you know, incredibly states that uh, that person's views were not taken into account at all before uh, this was brought forward. Indeed, in the, uh, the uh, bill briefing that the critic had with the minister's office, they uh, indicated that there was consultation and just at that exact point in time, uh, a press release was issued from the 
Privacy and Information's commissioner that disputed that, uh, that statement. There was no consultation. Uh, this is uh, helpful in terms of the letters, helpful in terms of understanding what the problems are and the desire to correct those problems before they uh, are released. And as others have pointed out before me, uh, this government has a, uh, a track record of com correcting bad legislation after the fact, uh, and this uh, opposition is merely trying to identify and work with uh, the uh, government to make sure that that doesn't happen at the get-go and, and can be uh, addressed up front. So with that, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I will uh, sit down and take my place. The Honourable Member, I see the Honourable Member for Edmonton Northwest has risen on A5. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And certainly, um, I think that perhaps the um, Honourable Member from Edmonton City Centre was saving the, ba less, uh, the best for last, um, because, uh, Mr. Chair, this amendment speaks specifically to what the Privacy Commissioner was talking about in regards to compromising the integrity of private information um, with this uh, amending act, uh, amending bill, I should say. And, um, Mr. Chair, you can see um, very specifically um, the Privacy Commissioner wrote um, a, a, a considerable uh, judgment on this bill saying that it should be pulled, and it should be pulled specifically from this section. Um, she talks about it on page five of her letter that she sent to the government. I hope you all read it. <clears throat> um, in this letter, um, they, she talks specifically about how <clears throat> with um, this change, this section, that um, the individual may be unable to be protected by the Privacy Commissioner by making this change in this bill to the Act. And I, I can't imagine a situation where a government would want to, to do that um, <clears throat> for someone to express explicitly that they did not want their health information to be shared. But um, certainly I can speculate, as I did before, talking about setting the stage, setting the table for more private health care, more private insurance, right? And that's, of course, the golden, um, um, if someone is trying to profit off others' misery, then it's the insurance that where you can really cash in. And so having that information and being unable to block someone who is trying to access that information is absolutely unconscionable. I know um, from years ago, um, when I was working as a public health advocate here in the province of Alberta, that we worked very closely and very carefully through electronic, the advent and the uh, dissemination of electronic health records, where you can have <clears throat> the record of your a patient or yourself, if you're the patient, um, being accessed by doctors and nurses and medical uh, uh, facilities across the province. And we worked really hard to make sure to ensure the integrity of that information because, of course, any slip of it <clears throat> can not just compromise the privacy of someone, but compromise the procedure and the health of that person, too. So we worked very hard to make sure that the integrity of that electronic health record system was secure and worked very closely with the Health Quality Council to help make that happen. And Mr. Chair, I can't help notice that <clears throat> this same UCP government who is now trying to compromise the integrity and the privacy of health records here in the province of Alberta has also sought to change the terms of reference of how the Health Quality Council presents information to the public here in the province of Alberta so that it has to present, I believe, through the minister. So again, these are two examples, I believe, of the cavalier attitudes that this government has towards public health care in the first place, and I would suggest much more diabolically their intentions to compromise the integrity of our public health system. Because when you are seeking to dismantle something that is so dear and so integral to the hearts and the health and the economy of our province, the first thing that you would do, I suppose, is have people and persons question the integrity of that system. And so by compromising the way by which we can protect 
public health, health records, that's a great way to start to undermine the system. Mr. Speaker, I would say, or Mr. Chair, I would suggest that that is an insidious way to undermine the integrity of our public health system, too. And so, lots of people have asked questions. I do have some answers based on watching previous conservative governments try to compromise the integrity of our public health system. But you know what, Mr. Chair? People always fight back in this province. People presume that uh, people are willing to say, oh yeah, I could buy some health insurance and everything will be fine. No, it doesn't work that way. Because we fought hard every step of the way to make sure that the attacks on our public health system were beaten back for a long time, since the inception of public health care. Yeah. And so we have a system in place that is strong, that is public, that it lives in the hearts and in the minds of four million Albertans here in the province. And so if you want to try to compromise that, you know that there are some four million Albertans that will push back. So it's Thank a word you. of warning. To Honourable this member, I, I hesitate to interrupt the Honourable member, but pursuant to Government Motion 55, the time for debate on this bill has now expired. I will now call the question on the amendment, followed by the questions on the bill. On the amendment as proposed by the Honourable Member for Edmonton City Centre on Amendment A5, all those in favour, please say aye. aye. Any opposed, please say no. Aye. That amendment is defeated. A division has been called. Call in the members. Thank you, Honourable Members. A division has been called on Amendment A-5. All those in favour of the amendment, please rise and be counted. Mr. Sabir, Member Hoffman, Mr. Agin, Ms. Pan Ms. Pancholi, Member Cece, Mr. Shepherd, Ms. Ganley. All those opposed to Amendment A-5, please rise. Honourable Mr. Copping, Honourable Mrs. Allard, Honourable Mr. Nixon, Honourable Mr. Taves, Honourable Mr. McIver, Honourable Mr. Glubish, Honourable, Honourable Mr. Luan, Honourable Mr. Madhu, 
Mr. Gottfried, Mr. Scow, Honorable Ms. Schultz, Honorable Mrs. Savage, Honorable Mr. Panda, Honorable Minister LaGrange, Mr. Newdorf, Honorable Mr. Nic Nicolaitis, Mr. Turton, Mr. Rutherford, Ms. Isaac, Honorable Mr. Wilson, Mr. Walker, Mr. Nixon, Honorable Mr. Hunter, Honorable Mr. Dreeshan. Mr. Chair, total for the amendment seven, total against 24. That amendment is defeated. On the clauses of the bill, Bill 46, Health Statutes Amendment Act 2020, number two. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed, please say no. no. That is carried. A division has been called. Call in the members. Thank you. Honorable members, the division has been called on the clauses of the bill. So, on the clauses of the bill, all those in favor, please rise. Honorable Mr. Copping, Honorable Mrs. Alar, Honorable Mr. Nixon, Honorable Mr. Taves, Honorable Mr. McIver, Honorable Mr. Glubish, Honorable Mr. Luan, Honorable Mr. Madhu, Mr. Gottfried, Mr. Ellis, Honorable Ms. Schultz, Honorable Mrs. Savage, Honorable Mr. Panda, Honorable Minister LaGrange, Mr. Newdorf, Honorable Minister Nicolaitis, Mr. Turton, Mr. Rutherford, Ms. Isaac, Honorable Mr. Wilson, Mr. Walker, Mr. Nixon, Honorable Mr. Hunter, Honorable Mr. Dreeshan. All those opposed, please rise. Mr. Sabir, Member Hoffman, Mr. Egan, Ms. Pancholi, Member Cece, Mr. Shepard, Ms. Ganley. Mr. Chair, total four, 24, total against seven. That is carried. 
on the title and preamble. Are you agreed? All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed, please say no. no. That is carried. Shall the bill be reported? Are you agreed? All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed, please say no. no. That is carried. The Committee of the Whole has now under consideration Bill 48, Red Tape Reduction Implementation Act 2020, number two. Um, I should make reference to the fact that Government Motion 59 passed earlier today that provides for one more hour of consideration on this. Therefore, are there any comments, questions, or amendments? To be offered with respect to this bill, I see the Honourable Member for Calgary Mountain View has risen. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm uh, pleased to rise once again on this bill, as you have just made reference. Uh, we are at time allocation with respect to this bill, uh, so I will uh, attempt to focus my comments. Um, this is one of three bills that have now uh, been time allocated at this stage. Um, certainly we just saw Bill uh, 46, which violates the privacy of Albertans, go through. Um, we are now seeing uh, this Bill 48, another omnibus bill under the guise of red tape reduction. Uh, and we will also see Bill 35, which is uh, an advancement of uh, the uh, corporate handout, uh, which is, of course, incredibly troubling because um, there's, there's nothing that Albertans, I'm sure, are happier to see than a government who looks at a policy that is an epic failure, has created no jobs, and in fact lost 50,000 prior to the pandemic, uh, and naturally the government has chosen to triple down on that. Um, so this bill is problematic. It's problematic like many other bills in this place. It's problematic because it's being uh, jammed through this legislature. Um, in an attempt uh, to avoid having to talk about um, a bill that violates the rights of workers. Uh, that bill uh, will likely come up later today, I imagine. Um, it's also, I think, um, an attempt by the government to ensure that uh, we get out of here as quickly as possible because I don't think they are enjoying being held to account on their pandemic response. So this bill uh, comes through, it's an enormous, enormous piece of legislation. Uh, one of the most problematic things about it is that it takes from municipal councils uh, the ability to determine timelines on development. And certainly um, in, in my hometown of Calgary, we have seen uh, some very problematic uh, moves. We've had a problem for years in that city um, where essentially developers profit off new development at the expense of the taxes of people um, who live in more established neighborhoods. Uh, and I think that's problematic. We see uh, rec centers and other facilities in those established neighborhoods uh, closing um, despite the increasing taxes placed on those residents. And so there's a fundamental unfairness to that. And, you know, we finally have a council who has started to address that fundamental unfairness. Um, and yet, for some, <laughs> well, I won't speculate on the reasons, but this government is moving forward to uh, counteract the ability of councils to do that. And this is a government who seems to delight on removing from other people the jurisdiction they have. Um, they still feel the need to blame those other people uh, for the limited decisions that they leave them with. Um, this is just one example. You know, city council, they love to blame city council for all sorts of that things, despite the fact that they withdraw MSI support. They download costs of policing onto them. They force city councils to raise property taxes because they have no other mechanisms to backfill the UCP cuts and then they're blamed. And again, we see this UCP government taking the power away from those people at the same time um, as they blame them. And we see them do the exact same thing um, with school boards. They cut funding uh, to those school boards. They they leave them in a position where they're taking on uh, additional students with no additional resources. Uh, they fire over 20,000 employees. 
they, um, they, you know, get rid of many, many educational assistants, uh, leaving students in a position that uh, they won't get the supports when they need them, and that's a deficit that can never be made up again. Um, once those children lose that opportunity, it is, it is gone, uh, and they were, will forever be altered by that. And yet, this government takes those actions, they harm those students, and then they blame school boards just like they blame municipalities uh, for dealing with the realities uh, that they are dealt. And so that, uh, I mean, it's a huge, huge concern. And at the same time, we see this piece of omnibus legislation rushing through the House. We see multiple other pieces of omnibus legislation rushing through the House, bills that are problematic on uh, an incredible number of fronts. We, we saw the government uh, step in to legislate um, with respect to child care, but refused to do anything about a fatality inquiry that resulted in multiple recommendations to the government to save the lives of children, to protect parents from having to bury their kids. Um, apparently, the government didn't have time to deal with that. But this, this they will try to rush through. And I think Albertans can see, Albertans can see what the priorities are of this government. Uh, their failure to act on their commitments, their failure to act with respect to COVID-19, their failure to act to keep students in schools safe, their failure to act to keep, uh, to increased protections for children in care in this province. Their failure to act on so very many fronts, often a failure to even acknowledge, a failure to acknowledge that this recession is having a more intense impact on women than it is on men. They won't even acknowledge that. Uh, that's extremely problematic, and yet what they're interested in is omnibus legislation, putting omnibus legislation through this House before Albertans have the opportunity to know what it is that they're doing. Because when Albertans do have the opportunity to weigh in, they weigh in in huge numbers. And they typically weigh in against what this government is doing. Um, certainly, we've seen Albertans in record numbers uh, weigh in to attempt in, to protect our public health care system, a public health care system that is under siege from this UCP government. We've seen them weigh in on in record numbers to protect the parks in this province, um, parks which are uh, to be delisted um, by this government. And then, uh, as I once said, the uh, land formerly known as parks, uh, can potentially be sold. Uh, so I think there are a lot of things to be concerned about in this legislature um, and in this bill. Uh, I mean, the, <laughs> the number of acts affected by this bill uh, are themselves uh, difficult to, to list. Uh, but there are a number of concerns. Um, there are changes all over. The Land Titles Act is pretty uh, fundamental uh, to the rights of Albertans. Most people um, aren't aware of it, but it's, it's a pretty important act. Um, they're combining uh, multiple boards into one board. And, I mean, there are huge open questions about what that's going to look like, right? Um, administrative decision-making in this process, in this province, is incredibly important. Um, you know, Albertans don't necessarily interact with all these systems every day, but these administrative decision makers, they um, guide our lives in a number of ways, and quite rightly so. Uh, but when changes are made to the boards and to the panels that make these decisions without experts, without Albertans, without people who understand these areas having time to weigh in and have an opinion on that, it is an incredible, incredible concern. Um, you know, we see once again this government uh, acting to put through a piece of legislation that, you know what, there are good things in this bill. 
there are bad things in this bill. Um, but certainly Albertans haven't had the time to weigh in on this, and that is in part because uh, their lives are challenging right now. Uh, people are busy. They're trying to work from home uh, at the same time as homeschooling their children. Um, you know, we have rising case numbers in this province. People are worried. They're worried for their lives and for the lives um, of their loved ones. They're under considerable financial strain. I mean, there's another uh, massive failure. There's somewhere that the government could have put their efforts instead of putting their efforts into this. Um, <laughs> which is to say the pandemic income support program. I mean, this only happened a few months ago and already people forget about it. Um, but this government uh, offered very limited pandemic supports to the people of this province, relying primarily on the federal government. Um, but essentially the system crashed repeatedly. It kicked people out for no obvious reason. Um, Ultimately, Albertans were accepted or declined on no rational basis whatsoever. It was entirely arbitrary, and very little creates stress in people, quite like arbitrary and unreasonable rules. Um, thousands who qualified were denied, again, for no actual reason, um, but it certainly did help this government with its bottom line. So. I mean, there are so many things that are of concern that are happening in this place. Uh, not just this bill, not just the bill we've previously discussed, but the bill that's coming, a bill uh, that triples down on a failed policy, a failed policy that attempted to create jobs and hasn't created one single job yet. Um, at the same time that this government talks a big game about job creation, they cut all of the diversification programs in this, in this province, saying that these things were a luxury. They cut 11,000 frontline healthcare workers, and they didn't just cut them. They didn't just lay them off. They had the audacity to claim that those who clean up vomit and other fluids during a pandemic are not, in fact, frontline, or to suggest that they are overpaid at $17 an hour. They laid off, as I mentioned, previously over 20,000 educational workers. That is a massive concern because at this time when children are increasingly being expected to learn online, it is at this moment that those children who struggle learning to read and with other, um, and with other matters need the most support. And it is this time that the government has withdrawn that support, while parents are under strain trying to homeschool at the same time uh, that they are working, um, while students are under significant mental challenge from being sort of bumped out of their usual routine, um, we see this government withdrawing supports from them, withdrawing supports when they need them uh, the most. And so, this bill, Mr. Speaker, is a concern. The closure on this bill uh, is a concern. And I think uh, the way that things are, are moving in this place uh, is a concern. So um, I think this bill is very problematic, and I would urge members of this House to vote against it. Thank you, Honourable Member. I see that the Honourable Member for Edmonton, Glenora, has risen to debate on 48. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and of course, folks have been watching with um, beta breath for updates on uh, the new measures that were foreshadowed earlier in the day, and uh, I have to say that, uh, first of all, I want to recognize the relationship between this legislation and municipalities and the decisions that were just uh, revealed to the province of Alberta. Uh, I know that uh, we've had municipal leaders um, begging the government to step up and make some uh, evidence-based decisions uh, on behalf of the entire province as it came to uh, masks and I guess um, better late than never. Certainly we are late. Uh, I believe the last province in the uh, country to act on this, but um, uh, I want to take a moment to recognize the municipal uh, advocates who have been working for this in our large urban centres, but also many rural uh, elected officials who will certainly be impacted by this omnibus legislation and, and their ability to work on behalf of their constituents uh, as they have to date. Um, there's much more to be said about the um, 
steps that were just rolled out, um, but I'll take this time to focus uh, the majority of my thoughts on the legislation and, and areas that I think are problematic. I want to reinforce that this is absolutely, by all definitions, an omnibus piece of legislation. The government's choosing to amend uh, several acts through one bill, and uh, many of these uh, acts that are going to be amended have only come into force in the last few years including one that I'll touch on that I don't believe I spoke to in prior stages, and that's around the new Home Buyer Protection Act, which was brought in in 2014. And I'll tell you that uh, under my experiences uh, and the experiences of many Albertans uh, in this province, uh, it's something that I wish I would have had in place in 2008 when I moved into uh, a new uh, condo. And uh, absolutely, it had been signed off by all of the checks and balances, the, the fire inspector and so forth. But once we were in that building for a couple of years, we started to realize uh, the significant deficits that existed. For example, a very tangible one, um, there were sprinklers throughout the building, which was great because it was a wood frame and uh, multi-family dwelling. Um, and the sprinklers had been installed before the stippling on the ceiling had been done. So the sprinklers were all covered in stipple and therefore all needed to be replaced. The, um, the panel, when you pulled the fire alarm on the third floor, uh, it was the one floor that wouldn't actually speak to the panel and therefore call the fire department automatically. There were a number of um, small but very serious errors um, made in the construction of that building. And over many years in doing our own building assessments and doing our own uh, bringing in the fire inspector and doing our own follow-ups, for example, another big one, this one was very costly, was the way the decks were wrapped. Instead of being wrapped horizontally with the seams hidden away from, uh, from the elements, they were wrapped uh, vertically, essentially, well, the uh, perpendiculars of uh, the fire safety report. One of the safeguards that was put in place after that time was the new home buyer um, uh, legislation. So that there would be this additional requirement for builders to have an assessment report for new condominium projects. So that everyone who's buying, we always, uh, often I hear the, the adage, you know, buyer beware. Uh, you can only beware of what, uh, what is evident to you and, and definitely you can do an inspection in your internal unit but knowing what the issues are in common property especially, I think is uh, something that, um, that was put in place for good reason. And I know that the government says, well, this is redundant, it's not necessary, but in 2014, uh, the other pieces of legislation were also in existence and it was ex considered necessary. So um, I would have uh, liked to have heard the government responsible, the government minister responsible for that piece, which I uh, imagine was probably Service Alberta, um, maybe Municipal Affairs, speak to the challenges with that regard in this bill. Um, uh, I don't believe that we've heard those questions answered in this place. And here we have the government moving uh, closure to fast track uh, its uh, expedition of this bill. Another piece that I want to speak in great, greater detail on is the Modernizing Municipal Government Act and Municipal Government Act, both being amended through this legislation. And this in itself could have been a standalone bill, was worthy of being a standalone bill when we've considered uh, amendments to other orders of government, including the municipal government. Um, we have taken our time to uh, review significant changes to their scope, their abilities their duties as um, members of this House to, to put these substantive changes that significantly curtail the role of municipal councils in this legislation, and, and also I would argue county and, and um, uh, other real municipality uh, mandates as well, municipal districts uh, being one of those, um, and towns. Um, to significantly change their role, their scope, their practice, in an omnibus piece of legislation uh, hidden in uh, section 9 deep into the bill already on page 30 and to do it in the middle of a pandemic when municipalities have been uh, uh, asked to step up and take uh, the courageous leadership positions that uh, this uh, premier and, and cabinet have failed to take in trying to protect their communities I think is um, very disrespectful of the relationship between the provincial government and, and local or municipal governments. And um, I will just mention that a couple of the challenges I, I feel most strongly about in this regard um, relate to the role of municipal 
um, decision makers and their uh, authorities when it comes to municipal development. Um, I'm just going to pull up a couple of the comments here that I wanted to um, to share. But specifically, um, the tighter timelines for development permits means that uh, municipalities won't be able to undergo the thorough peer review process that's being currently in place by Urban Design Review Panel and in Calgary in particular by the Planning Commission. Uh, both bodies have citizen representatives who are experts in the fields of planning, design and development and they uh, absolutely won't be able to do their work under these new um, condensed timelines. Um, the City of Calgary relies on the expertise from uh, great communities and uh, to ensure that uh, the city is growing in a way that's sustainable and focused on um, making sure that our, our communities are places where you want to live, work and, and have some fun when we're allowed to do so, <laughs> together especially. And the right timelines, um, I, I believe, force uh, council um, to become a de facto, de facto development authority rather than allowing council to engage with the appropriate authorities and stakeholders to make sure that they're making decisions around future growth and development in the best interests of their municipalities. This is one of the, the primary focuses of municipal councils, given the um, uh, changes that have been made over many, many years to the role of local decision makers as councillors. And that means that development permits are possibly going to get uh, denied because of the fast track process, uh, kicking them um, to the minister who uh, isn't aware of the local um, uh, experiences to the same degree as local councillors would be. And um, I believe that this is a, a repeal of the ability of the city to negotiate timelines with industry and to exercise the authority that was democratically given to them. And uh, you know, perhaps it shouldn't shock me because we have heard uh, some statements in this place that are incredibly disrespectful to uh, local decision makers, uh, especially recently when it comes to uh, their ability to uh, assess information, set budgets, set, um, set priorities for the municipalities. There have been uh, repeated uh, aggressive uh, verbal uh, attacks on specific and sometimes general councillors uh, throughout our province. And um, I think that um, the people who were elected to those <coughs> roles are the ones who um, are accountable to their electorate. So if um, members of this order of government want to uh, uh, raise their concerns with, um, with local decision makers, I say fill your boots, but to do it in such an aggressive, overt and disrespectful fashion uh, in this place where uh, many times the speaker, I uh, imagine you Mr. Chair, has raised uh, grave concerns about people not being able to uh, defend oneself or, or comment in response to some of the uh, direct attacks that are issued on them. Uh, it probably shouldn't shock me that the government is bringing forward bills that also attack their authority and ability to make decisions on behalf of their electorate. Um, those are two of the areas, and, and you know there are many, many others. There's, of course, uh, the Centennial Metal Act, which I believe uh, makes uh, the only power that still remains is a power to revoke a Centennial Medal that somebody has received, uh, because they won't be giving additional ones. Okay, so be it. But to put in the power to revoke one seems um, uh, really uh, interesting to me. Um, the Animal Health Act, uh, an another piece that's being amended, the Child Youth and Family Enhancement Act, being amended, uh, Fatality Inquiry Act, Historical Resources Act, Land and Property Rights Tribunal Act, Land Titles Act, Maintenance Enforcement Act. I mentioned the two pieces of municipal legislation and the home buyers. And then, of course, there's Post Secondary Learning Act, the Professions and Occupational uh, Associations Registrations Act, and Will and Succession Act. Um, they, these are massive changes to a number of bills, and this government has chosen to uh, not only lump them all together into one big omnibus bill in the middle of a pandemic when they feel like they have less public scrutiny and oversight, but they've also chosen during that public pandemic state of emergency uh, under um, these conditions 
to bring forward uh, closure, to uh, ram these through uh, in a fashion that they so choose, and um, to do so with the majority of the debate happening either in the midst of major um, announcements that are being made in the province of Alberta, and of course, rightfully so, Albertans are focused on the announcements that are being made and how those are going to change their lives uh, effective uh, immediately or as of Saturday. Um, and they're, uh, or in the middle of the night, because I imagine we will probably be discussing some of these things into the wee hours tonight, because the government was so eager to leave yesterday uh, before 10 p.m. They only reconvened the House for a couple of hours last night, and to cancel this morning completely. So we have to, uh, of course, debate these issues uh, in the middle of uh, an address by, uh, by the, go the government and senior health officials, uh, and uh, in the midst of uh, the middle of the night. So it definitely speaks to the lack of transparency and respect when it comes to our municipal partners. Um, I, I would say they are not behaving in a partly fashion with this bill. Um, and I also uh, fear for uh, other new home buyers who were relying on that additional check and balance that will uh, no longer be in place, particularly condo home buyers. Uh, we've seen many issues with condos in the past, and uh, I fear we're only going to see more under um, less oversight that's being rammed through by this, by this change. Um, and at the same time, Mr. Chair, we're telling everyone that they must work from home Unless they're in a profession like a teacher uh, for a high school student, then they must come into the school building. Uh, some of these changes uh, seem to not be consistent with um, uh, logic uh, when it comes to this bill, its legislation, or some of the uh, announcements that are being made by this government at this very time. So uh, with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I'll cede the remainder of my time to my colleagues because I'm sure that... Uh, uh, many have a lot of things to say, and there is, of course, uh, time constraint on this. So, thank you. Thank you, Honourable Member. Are there any members wishing to join debate on 48? I see the Honourable Member for Edmonton Whitemud has risen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm pleased to rise to speak and, and committee the whole on Bill 48. And I think I want to thank my colleagues uh, before me today here, the member from Edmonton Glenora and the member from Calgary Mountain View, for providing an excellent summary of the variety of different pieces of legislation that are have been crammed into this yet another omnibus piece of legislation and the concerns that those uh, those pieces of legislation raise. And, and I won't go into too much detail, uh, Mr. Chair, with respect to the concerns they've raised around the Municipal Government Act. The, I thank the member from Edmonton Glenora for talking about condos. Um, I'd like to focus my comments today a little bit on the changes to the Child, Youth and Family Enhancement Act. Now I've already had an opportunity, Mr. Chair, to rise in this House and speak about my concern that despite um, the commitment made by this government, from the, by the Minister of Children's Services, to um, follow through on the action plan that was developed as a result of the um, all-party uh, ministerial panel on child intervention, which laid out a clear action plan for significant steps to be taken by the government to uh, improve our child intervention system, specifically with the focus around reducing the number of, uh, of Indigenous children in care. And that action plan had a clear target date within it as part of its um, um, short-term um, uh, actions, and that was to amend the Child, Youth and Family Enhancement Act by 2020, which as we all know is only a couple weeks away now, um, the end of the year, um, and it was meant to, there was a commitment, there has been a confirmation from the Minister of Children's and Services that she is committed to doing the work under the action plan, um, and yet uh, the amendments that were supposed to be made in that action plan to the Child, Youth and Family Enhancement Act are not before the Assembly today, and I was frustrated, Mr. Chair, Chair, when I saw Bill 48 and I saw amendments were being made to the Child, Youth and Family Enhancement Act, I thought, okay, finally maybe they're carrying through on that commitment, which is not a, a partisan issue. It was something that all parties in this House at that time and the current parties right now agreed to, which was to make substantive changes to that act to um, improve the outcomes for Indigenous children in care and to reduce the number of Indigenous children in care. But Yet, when I re reviewed Bill 48 and I opened it up, I was shocked to see that there was nothing in this bill that is meant to address the commitment that the government of Alberta, under two governing parties now, has made to Indigenous communities and Indigenous children in care in this province. I, I still would like to hear a clear answer from the Minister of Children's Services and from this government as to why they are failing on that commitment. Because under, this under the watch of this government, the, the percentage of children, Indigenous children in care has gone up. 
Now, I realize it's been a challenging year for all, but our most vulnerable children are the ones that we should be focusing on the most, and yet they are the ones, we have an increase in number. So if there was ever a priority for this government, well, we see what the priorities are from this government, um, it should be making sure that we're taking all the steps we, we can and we have committed to as a government to actually um, to make the legislative changes around the role of the band designate um, and do that work as we're supposed to, as they, this government committed to do, and yet they are not doing it. Now, the Minister of Children's Services has risen in this House and given all kinds of explanations and, and tried to uh, uh, diminish uh, the work of that action plan by saying, oh, it's all on hold now, or it's complicated now because of Bill C-92, the federal legislation which allows for uh, Indigenous groups to, take, um, to have autonomy over the child welfare system um, in their communities, which is, it is a significant piece of legislation, and it is complex, but that is not a reason for this government to abdicate their responsibility to children in care. Um, they still have a commitment. There's a lot up in the air on that bill. And so to fail to address those issues when this, that act is open before the Assembly, I think is an abdication of responsibility. So I'll have to say that again, Mr. Chair, because I'm deeply disappointed by that. I also want to talk a little bit about the changes that have been made in this bill around adoption. Now, I will, after that little fiery piece, I will say there are pieces that are changes that have been made here within Bill 48 around post-adoption processes and the principles to be considered when placing a child up for adoption, or in an adoptive home, I should say, um, that are good, that I am supportive of, that I think are important work. Um, however, I don't quite see, and I, I had the opportunity to review the comments from the Minister of Children's Services with respect to Bill 48, as to how this is necessarily carrying through with the significant challenges that were raised uh, by uh, the motion brought forward by the member from Spruce Grove, Stony Plain, um, about the, the significant challenges in Albertans face, prospective parents face, going through the adoption process. I reviewed the changes in Bill 48 in detail. There are a couple minor changes about the actual adoption process. Um, which I have heard from my constituents, I have heard from friends who have been involved in the adoption process who talk about, of course, the, the length of time of that process, how heart-wrenching it can be, how exhausting it can be um, to try to actually uh, successfully adopt a child. And so we all in this House stood in favour and supported that, that motion um, last session uh, on improving the processes around adoption. I don't see those changes in Bill 48. Now, I am cognizant of the fact that the Minister of Children's Services has indicated that there will be further changes coming in the uh, regulations. And on that, we will just have to trust the Minister of Children's Services. Um, but given as how she's uh, managed the uh, changes to childcare, um, I'm not confident uh, in, in what will happen in those regulations. But I do hope that we will see regulations making substantive changes to the processes, because I can tell you that Bill 48 does not seem to do that. Now, it does proclaim a private member's bill from the previous legislature. Um, uh, that was brought forward by the now Minister uh, of uh, Culture, Multiculturalism and Status of Women around posting prospective parents' profiles online. And I think that's a good change. I believe I was not part of the legislature when that private member's bill was, was uh, up for debate, but I understand that all parties in the House uh, voted in favour of that, and proclaiming that is certainly a good step. It certainly doesn't have to be part of, um, of uh, an omnibus piece of legislation like this. Uh, it could have been done through miscellaneous statutes. It's just, really, it's a proclamation. I don't even really know that it had to be done specifically through a bill. Um, but uh, I, that's great. That's a good thing to do. I, I won't dispute that. I certainly heard that specific comment from uh, constituents saying that they would like the option to do that. But in terms of actually addressing the outcomes of uh, improving the outcomes and the speed um, of the process for adoption, I do not see those changes in this bill. I also want to address one other specific issue around adoption. And that was, earlier this year, um, one of the only four adoption agencies in Alberta, which was the Adoptions by Choice, uh, closed quite suddenly and quite dramatically. Um, and they, they gave very little um, notice to the, to the families who had, to that point, invested thousands of dollars uh, in that agency, had invested years of their time in hopes of, of becoming prospective parents. Um, and um, it was shut down quite suddenly. And I was contacted by many of those, um, those prospective parents and had some very heart-wrenching conversations with a lot of them. For many of them, they were told, you know, they told me that um, the sudden closure of this adoption agency, losing all of the money they'd invested, all of the time they'd invested, they would, they would have to go to the back of the line with any new adoption agency, and they were heartbroken. 
They'd already gone through, for most of them, a very gut-wrenching process of realizing for many of them that they would not become biological parents themselves. They'd gone through infertility, they'd gone through several measures, and so they, were, they had now engaged in the process of adoption. They had lost so much money and time, many of them said they would not, this was the end of their adoption journey. It was absolutely heartbreaking. But then what was most troubling, Mr. Chair, is that when that came out, looking back, it became clear very, uh, very evident that, um, that there was actually significant problems with this adoption agency that very suddenly closed and ended the adoption journey for many of these families. There was clear problems with the executive director and chair of the board of this agency, who was under criminal investigation, was invest under investigation through the uh, Alberta College of Social Workers for fraud. Uh, and this was all, you know, very upsetting, but most importantly, this information had been brought to the attention of the Ministry of Children's Services. They were aware of this, and to that end, the Ministry of Children's Services had issued two conditional licenses in a row to that adoption agency. And yet nobody from the ministry required either the agency themselves to let these parents know that there were problems with the way this agency was operating, nor did they advise them themselves. And now the minister has indicated in her comments on this bill that she's made changes now, she'll be making changes which will require clients to immediately notify, or sorry, which would require agencies to immediately notify clients if their license has become conditional. And while that might be a good change, it's interesting that, that the ministry itself did not avail itself of the authority that it actually has under the current provisions of the Child, Youth, and Family Enhancement Act. Under Section 89, Subsection 7 of the current act, not changed by this legislation, a director from Children's Services is supposed to notify the clients of a licensed adoption agency of a decision to add conditions to a license. And yet the Ministry of Children's Services never did that. And some of those parents who lost their, their money, who lost thousands of dollars and lost their time, would not have gone to that adoption agency had they been notified. Many of them who, well after these conditional licenses were given to this adoption agency, adoptions by choice, by the Ministry of Children's Services, many of these parents and these, uh, these clients still invested thousands of dollars. Had they done that, if they had known that there was conditions and what those conditions are, had the ministry done what they were supposed to do under the current legislation, maybe some of those families would have saved some heartache and some money. But they didn't do that. So I'm happy to hear that the Ministry of Children's Services is now going to make some changes to require the agency to notify their clients when there are problems with their license. But I want to point out, for the record, Mr. Chair, that that authority already rests with the Ministry of Children's Services to notify clients of an agency where conditions have been placed on that license. And in this situation, to the detriment of 90 Alberta families, who have lost money and lost time and, lost, and have invested um, a great deal of emotional energy into the process of adoption, they failed those families. And so I'm happy to hear that the minister is taking action to improve that, but she should also take accountability for the failure on the part of her ministry to actually help these families when she should have. So with that being said, Mr. Chair, I, I have to express that I am, while there are pieces of Bill 48 with respect to adoption that I think are good in terms of the information to connect families post-adoption, it fails on many other fronts in terms of doing, following the commitments under the Ministerial Panel on Child Intervention, um, and it certainly uh, does not do, I believe, in this bill, as it's suggested by the Minister, it does not improve the process of adoption uh, the way that uh, the, the Minister is lauding that it does. It, it simply does not do that. I hope the regulations will make the changes on behalf of those families who are looking to adopt a child. I sincerely hope that the process is improved, and I'll be watching that with great interest. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Honourable Member. Are there any other members looking to join debate on 48? I see the Honourable Member for Calgary Buffalo has risen. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity to speak to Bill 48 and to follow my colleagues from uh, White Mud City Centre, uh, Calgary Mountain View, uh, and as they focus on different aspects of Bill 48 and uh, a bill that uh, the part of the bill that I'll focus on is with regard to the changes to the MGA. And Mr. Chair, what I did to try and uh, uh, understand completely the changes to the NDA and the amendments that are being brought forward uh, is to talk to different planners, whether they be retired or currently working. Um, and uh, one that I talked to said they agree with me that these amendments are substantive and significant and need to be dealt with separately after lengthy consultation process with uh, 
all municipalities and uh, in particular uh, the public as well because the public is involved as we know uh, with the outcomes of decisions made at the municipal level across the uh, province and 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 the buildings that uh, and the communities and the uh, decisions get made have to be uh, lived with by Albertans for a, a, a very long time. So that question is a good one. Uh, we're, and I recognize hearing from the former Minister of Municipal Affairs in the past that uh, there was consultation, I believe it was in early 2020, um, and that uh, the development industry was involved, planners were involved. Uh, or the Association for Planners was involved, uh, RMA, AUMA, uh, and the two large cities. But that's really not uh, comprehensive in terms of who are impacted by this. Uh, there was no public consultation of this, as I can understand. And, uh, you know, the planners I talked to said there should be no rush as municipal staff are operating generally from their homes and consultation among staff and staff to council members is not ideal at this moment. And that's really true. Uh, I know many of the councils across the province are dealing with uh, uh, electronic council meetings, Zoom and other things, and uh, the opportunity to get dig into uh, these decisions is uh, 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 way late in terms of uh, their opportunities. The, the, uh, I'll get to the RMA's recent letter on this uh, uh, in a second, but I just wanted to point out that, you know, we're talking about the MGA and this planner talks about, the con again, the concept of a land use bylaw, which has been in the Planning Act since 1978, is being changed without consultation, uh, without public consultation. Uh, the public, I guess, is uh, the representatives, uh, as I understand the former Minister of Municipal Affairs and those groups that I mentioned earlier. But the new system, as proposed, will be a fundamental shift, this person goes on to say, in the regulation of land and the development in this province. Um, so I want to focus on a couple specific items in this uh, 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 bill. Changes to the time to make a decision. And, and the person I consulted with was uh, 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 you know, a 25-year planner with the City of Calgary. Uh, and they said section 640.1 of the NGA sets, sets the time frame to make a decision with the municipality through their land use bylaw. The new changes will dictate the time frame in the MGA. The previous time frames were in effect for six months. Uh, the previous time frames will be in effect for six months. So there's a six month grandfather period. But by the time the municipality must follow the new um, but after that time, the municipality must follow a new 60-day decision date. That may be easy for municipalities that have uh, a lower volume of subdivision development applications, but the complexity of the subdivisions and development applications has a direct correlation with the time it takes to process the application. And that's just, this makes sense, Mr. Chair, that uh, there's cir circulation referees and really complex uh, and, and, you know, dozens of people to weigh in on uh, difficult and complex applications or developments. Um, and all those circulation referees need time to uh, go through that. And during COVID, these circulation timelines have been protracted as staff are working from home and it's difficult to get them around uh, tables to do detailed uh, 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 team reviews on uh, uh, important, uh, complicated developments coming forward. So there's no one, one time or one size fits all approach to subdivision development applications. A complex multi-story, as you can appreciate, build office building in an urban setting takes a lot longer to review and discuss amongst applicants with applicants than, uh, than an industrial building perhaps does or a new subdivision of 600 residential part parcels uh, with uh, some parks and a shopping center, a local school. It takes longer to evaluate those kinds of things than perhaps a farmstead separation which presumably uh, these kinds of changes would fit within. So the municipalities, as I understand it, uh, with this new amendment, can set their own time frames, but they have to 
uh, go back to the minister and say, you know, these are the time frames we've established in agreement with developers or applicants, and uh, the minister can uh, uh, look at those time frames, those reportings, and perhaps come down on municipalities and say, no, I want those to be a lot shorter, I want them to be uh, more compact uh, time-wise, but really, if it's a development uh, that is complex and needs that opportunity to have many circulation referees involved, uh, going back and forth with the applicant. What, what's the rush? I mean, these are buildings and uh, uh, developments that will be around for generations and generations. Indeed, we're, we're uh, taking uh, those, those people are, are building heritage buildings for the, or designing heritage buildings for the future and approving heritage buildings for the future. So. What are the comments from all municipalities with regard to that? I know AUMA and RMA uh, weighed in, and perhaps now is the time to consider what uh, RMA's analysis of this just recently put out um, on the 4th of December. Uh, recently uh, put on their website for all to see, it says, RMA is concerned that Bill 48 proposes reductions in municipal autonomy. Let's just think about municipal autonomy. This government has been uh, pretty fast and loose with uh, uh, going, uh, uh, rolling over municipalities in this province, and this is another example of that, uh, members of the uh, uh, legislature. So the RMA is concerned that Bill 48 proposes reductions in municipal autonomy based on limited evidence from the development industry that the changes will have a meaningful impact in redu reducing red tape and or supporting economic growth and job creation. That's not an, an, a, a ringing endorsement of uh, actions being put forward by the government, I can tell you. Um, it's, it's uh, um, in my view, it's, it's looking at the decisions being made by the government and saying, really, you've only looked at one side of the, uh, the, the ledger, and that is uh, the ledger of the development industry, uh, who um, members on the other side uh, like to be called job creators. And so those job creators are really, uh, 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 you know, setting the tune for this government and at the, uh, at the uh, downfall of municipal, municipal autonomy. It goes on to say, in general, in general, uh, RMA, of course, supports red, red tape reduction initiatives if they are based on evidence-supported concerns with current legislation and processes. And then it goes on to kind of come out in a damning way and say, however, if the concept of red tape reduction cannot be used as a catch-all to justify reducing municipal authority over land use planning and other areas without understanding the potential benefits and consequences of such a reduction. So really, um, the RMA is speaking up for all municipalities and saying, you know, this looks like an overreach. Uh, uh, on, uh, with the government using, the minister using uh, red tape reduction as the rationale and uh, RMA is refuting that, saying it cannot be used as a catch-all to justify reducing municipal authority, which it is doing, over land use planning and other areas without understanding the potential benefits and consequences of su such a reduction. And, um, that there is a penultimate line here as well. RMA is particularly concerned with changes to the scope of the SDABs and MGB in hearing applications um, and development decisions on provincially regulated properties, uh, mm -hmm. and it goes on. So the uh, um, RMA will continue to advocate for all changes to be evidence-based and linked to economic growth and job creation. I think it's pretty clear that uh, the views of, of uh, the writers and RMA, it's under their uh, title, um, are questioning uh, some of the rationale and the, uh, the loss of municipal autonomy. And uh, as I said, this is not the first time that we're dealing with the loss of municipal uh, autonomy in this, in this legislature. Bill, uh, the Local Authorities Election Act 
uh, where this government steamrolled over the wishes of uh, municipalities with regard to uh, the holding of uh, uh, referendums and Senate elections when there was expressed views put forward by the associations, uh, RMA, AUMA, the mayors of different cities and towns around this province uh, that said, we don't want that in uh, our local elections. Keep your uh, uh, referendums, keep your Senate elections, uh, and do it yourself um, during your own time frame, which is in 2023, can't come fast enough, or uh, some other time when uh, uh, you want to hold the province of Alberta those referendums. Do it then. But uh, this government uh, didn't think about any of that stuff. It didn't uh, agree with any of that. It said, we'll, we'll do what we want to do, and we're going to save money and time in doing it. Well, you know, I've got news for you that, the, that elections still, those kinds of things still cost money, but I, but I, I understand that you're going to download those costs onto municipalities across the province. You're not talking about uh, giving more money to uh, uh, the chief electoral officer, which uh, that person came forward and requested one, I think it was $1.6 million to hold, uh, uh, to, fill, to partner with municipalities around the province. But it wasn't something that members of the, the Democratic Accountability Committee, uh, the, me the, the majority membership on the government side agreed to. So the chief electoral officer said, I need $1.6 million to hold those kinds of uh, 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 referendum and Senate elections. But there was nothing forthcoming from the government. So they're downloading costs onto municipalities. They're, they're not listening to the autonomous views of municipalities. They're believing they're creations of the province and they should be treated as, as uh, children of the province. When, when really, they're, yeah, they are creations of the province, but they should be treated as you know, people who know what they're doing, long-term councillors and administrators and people in uh, uh, um, uh, bureaucracies around this province who have spent their, their whole lives working for the local citizenry at the local government level. So, Mr. Chair, there's uh, lots of reasons to uh, 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 not support parts of this uh, bill that have come forward and to oppose them, and my colleagues and I will oppose uh, Bill 48 because... Uh, it, it's an omnibus bill that is, should have come forward with the support of individual ministers around the uh, various aspects of uh, the acts that are being changed, but still it's an omnibus that purports to be red tape reduction. But, you know, the RMA, by, by their own admission, say there's uh, n nothing to do, it's not science, I'm sorry, not evidence-based in terms of the, the changes that are being brought forward. Uh, basically, what I get from this is, you know, the government listened to the, the developers and uh, didn't take the views of all municipalities nor the public into mind before they made the changes and uh, the, the local, local uh, councils around the province, local municipalities around the province have to live with those changes. But it'll, it won't create a, a better uh, situation at the local level in terms of development and, and uh, uh, applications for, for uh, land use, uh, for development permits, um, and as this planner says, you know, they're, they're involved in developments for uh, the building of the future heritage buildings of, uh, of our time in the future. And so with that uh, said, Mr. Chair, I'm going to take my seat and, of course, oppose this bill. Thank you, Honourable Member. Are there any members wishing to join debate on 48? I see the Honourable Member for Edmonton City Centre has risen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the opportunity to rise and speak to Bill 48, the Red Tape Reduction Act. I'm going to follow on some of the comments from my colleague from Calgary, Buffalo. You know, as a representative for a urban constituency, indeed in the heart of the city, there is a lot of discussion and a lot of interest around development and around city building. I have a lot of folks that live in my constituency that work for the city of Edmonton and work in the planning department that are very passionate about urbanization. 
And I have a lot of people who are very interested in the ongoing development. I can speak to the Oliver Community League here in my constituency. I would say probably one of the, in the past has been and continues to be one of the most active community leagues in our city and has participated, I think, probably more than any other community league in this city in discussions with city council and at meetings about development, and not just in the heart of the city in our neighborhood here, but indeed with expansion of the city in other areas. And the reason for that, Mr. Chair, is because my constituency here, and particularly the neighborhood of Oliver, is one of the densest in the city of Edmonton one of the most heavily developed, and indeed carries a significant amount of the weight in terms of residential and property taxes. And those taxes, Mr. Chair, go to fund city services for new neighborhoods which are built on the outskirts of the city. Now, I don't bring that up by way of complaint. I know that's been a common refrain in this place when we complain about Alberta, how much Alberta sends to Ottawa and gets back in return, or the member for Highwood at one point was complaining about uh, the Calgary City Council's police budget and how dare they cut the city budget because that affects policing in his area. So Calgary should be subsidizing the policing for other parts of the province. That's not what I'm getting at here, but it is a consideration, Mr. Chair, because when we have unchecked development on the fringes of our city, it does drive up costs for the more developed and older neighborhoods in the city. Because often we are not seeing enough property tax revenue from those new neighborhoods to cover the cost of extending services, transit, sewer, policing, fire department, all of those additional infrastructure, recreation facilities, Mr. Chair. Those are all additional costs that come with further development on the edges of a city. And indeed, there is a growing recognition that we need to be more conscious of this, that we went through a era in some municipalities in particular, certainly uh, in Calgary, this has been a real issue, but of unchecked sprawl, where development was simply allowed to go on without much thought or much consideration and has created some difficult circumstances. Indeed, I know in the heart of Calgary, they were carrying the office towers, and they were carrying a significant amount of the property tax for the city of Calgary compared to the residential developments that had expanded outside the edges of the city. And that has become a major issue for Calgary City Council now with the prolonged economic downturn due to the drop in the price of oil and now, of course, the worldwide pandemic. So it is incredibly important that cities, that municipalities, be empowered, I think, Mr. Chair, to set their own timelines to make their own decisions regarding further development. But what we have here in Bill 48 is this government, as it has so often done with municipalities, dictating to them what it feels they should do based on who it considers perhaps to be its friends. My colleague from Calgary Buffalo, noted the concerns that were raised by the RMA regarding these changes. Now, the minister, the, or pardon me, the associate minister for reduction of red tape stated that overall this was needed to speed up the timelines for subdivisions and development permits and to provide needed certainty for these job creators. I find it fascinating, Mr. Chair, to look at who this government is concerned with providing certainty to and whom they are not. Because they are fast working to undermine certainty for all kinds of organizations. They are quite happy to undermine all certainty for physicians in the province of Alberta and put them utterly at the whim of the Minister of Health. 
They are utterly willing to take away certainty for Albertans in terms of their protection of their health information. But in this particular case, seem to feel that it is absolutely essential that property developers have certainty at the expense of the local municipalities. To interrupt the honourable member, but uh, pursuant to Government Motion 59, the time for debate on this bill has now expired. I will now call the question. On the clauses of the bill, Bill 48, Red Tape Reduction Implementation Act 2020, number 2, are you agreed? All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Any opposed, please say no. no. That is carried, and I see a division has been called. Call on the members. With that. Honourable members, the division has been called on the clauses of the bill, Bill 48, Red Tape Reduction Implementation Act 2020, number 2. If you are agreed with the clauses, please rise and be counted. The Honourable Mr. Nixon, the Honourable Mr. Madhu, the Honourable Mrs. Savage, the Honourable Mrs. Allard, the Honourable Mr. Glubish, the Honourable Mr. Luan, the Honourable Mr. Copping, Mr. Ellis, the Honourable Mr. Nally, the Honourable Ms. Schultz, the Honourable Mr. Panda, the Honourable Minister Lagrange, Mr. Newdorf, Mr. Rutherford, the Honourable Mr. Nicolaides, Mr. Churton, the Honourable Mr. Hunter, Ms. Isaac, the Honourable Mr. Wilson, Mr. Walker, Mr. Nixon, the Honourable Mr. Dreesham. All those opposed, please rise and be counted. Mr. Sabir, Member Hoffman, Mr. Egan, Mr. Sisi, Mr. Shepherd. Ms. Ganley.
Mr. Chair, Chair, total in favor, 22, total against, 6. Thank you, honourable members. That is carried. On the title and preamble, are you agreed? All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Any opposed, please say no. no. That is carried. A division has been called. Call on the members. Honourable Members, the division has been called on the title and preamble. All those in favour or agreed with the title and preamble, please rise and be counted. The Honourable Mr. Nixon, the Honourable Mr. Madhu, the Honourable Mrs. Savage, the Honourable Mrs. Allard, the Honourable Mr. Glubish, the, the Honourable Mr. Luan, the Honourable Mr. Copping, Mr. Ellis, the Honourable Mr. Nally, the Honourable Ms. Schultz, the Honourable Mr. Panda, the Honourable Minister LaGrange, Mr. Newdorf, Mr. Rutherford, the Honourable Mr. Nicolaides, Mr. Turton, the Honourable Mr. Hunter, Ms. Isaac, the Honourable Mr. Wilson, Mr. Walker, Mr. Nixon, the Honourable Mr. Schweitzer, the Honourable Mr. Dresion. All those opposed, please rise and be counted. Mr. Sabir, Member Hoffman, Mr. Egan, Member Sisi, Mr. Shepherd, Ms. Gamble. Mr. Chair, total in favour, 23. Total against, 6. That is carried. Shall the bill be reported? Are you agreed? All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Any opposed, please say no. no. That is carried. A division has been called. Call on the members. <laughs>
Honourable Members, a division was called on whether the bill should be reported, Bill 48, Red Tape Reduction Implementation Act 2020, Number 2. All those agreed with reporting the bill, please rise and be counted. The Honourable Mr. Nixon, the Honourable Mr. Madhu, the Honourable Mrs. Savage, the Honourable Mrs. Allard, the Honourable Mr. Glugish, the Honourable Mr. Luan, the Honourable Mr. Copping, Mr. Ellis, the Honourable Mr. Nally, the Honourable Ms. Schultz, the Honourable Mr. Panda, the Honourable Minister Lagrange, Mr. Newdorf, Mr. Rutherford, the Honourable Mr. Nicolaides, Mr. Churton, the Honourable Mr. Hunter, Ms. Isaac, the Honourable Mr. Wilson, Mr. Walker, Mr. Nixon, the Honourable Mr. Schweitzer, the Honourable Mr. Dresion. Honourable Members, all those opposed, please rise and be counted. Mr. Savir, Member Hoffman, Mr. Egan, Member Sisi, Mr. Shepherd, Ms. Ganley. Mr. Chair, total in favour 23, total against 6. Honourable Members, that is carried and so ordered. I see the Honourable Deputy Government House Leader has risen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I thank Mr. Chair. It has been a productive evening. I move that the committee rise and report Bill 46 and 48. Having heard the motion as proposed by the Honourable Deputy Government House Leader, are you agreed? All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Any opposed, please say no. no. That is carried. And a division has been called. Right. Call on the members. Honourable Members, a division has been called with regards to the motion to rise and report Bill 46 and 48. All those in favour of rising and reporting, please rise and be counted.
The Honorable Mr. Nixon, the Honorable Mr. Madhu, the Honorable Mrs. Savage, the Honorable Mrs. Allard, the Honorable Mr. Glubish, the Honorable Mr. Luan, the Honorable Mr. Copping, Mr. Ellis, the Honorable Mr. Nally, the Honorable Ms. Schultz, the Honorable Mr. Panda, the Honorable Minister Lagrange, Mr. Newdorf, Mr. Rutherford, the Honorable Mr. Nicolaides, Mr. Churton, the Honorable Mr. Hunter, Ms. Isaac, the Honorable Mr. Wilson, Mr. Walker, Mr. Nixon, the Honorable Mr. Schweitzer, the Honorable Mr. Dresion. Thank you. All those members opposed to rising and reporting bills 46 and 48, please stand and be counted. Mr. Sabir, Member Hoffman, Mr. Egan, Member Sisi, Mr. Shepard, Ms. Ganley. Mr. Chair, total in favor, 23, total against, 6. Now rise and roll. 